driver's seat today. Um, let's start with uh, roll call. Foley? Here. Corrales? Esparza? Here. Cohen? Here. And David? Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to just start by reminding everybody of the code of conduct that um, includes commenting on specific agenda items only and addressing the full body, no individuals. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members, or staff. All members of the committee, staff, and public are expected to refrain from abusive language and repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of the meeting may result in removal from the meeting. So we'll start uh, with item D D1, which is the first item on the agenda. That's our tree audit. So we'll turn it over to um, who's going to start. Uh, go ahead, Joe. So good afternoon, Joy, City Auditor. I'm here. Um, I'm here to present our audit tree removals and replacements. The city can improve processes to protect and grow the community forests. Allison Polly and Michael O'Connell Jr. from my office are here remotely. I'm also in the uh, in the box is Chris Burton from Planning Building Code Enforcement, and John Ristow and Rick Scott from Department of Transportation. with me. Okay. 
San Jose's community forest is comprised of 1.6 million trees on private and public property. Most trees are located on private property. However, about 300,000 trees are on public property or rights of way, including about 270,000 street trees, the mass, vast majority of which are maintained by private property owners. In February 2022, the city adopted Community Forest Management Plan, or CFMP, to grow and maintain the community forest. Along with that adoption of the plan was direction to conduct this audit, the purpose of which was to review how and whether the city is collecting tree-related mitigation fees from developers, how and whether the city is enforcing tree planting conditions on development, how the city is spending tree mitigation funds, and how the city can most cost-effectively plant more trees. Multiple city departments play a role with managing or overseeing the removal, replacement, planting, and monitoring of tree-related activities. For purposes of this audit, the Departments of Transportation, DOT, and Planning, Building, Code Enforcement, PPCE, were the primary departments we worked with to address the audit objectives. DOT houses the city arborist team that oversees tree planting and maintenance for public trees, excluding parks, which are handled by the Department of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. The Planning Division of PPCE processes applications for private property tree removals. Public Works also manages landscaping for public projects and reviews impacts of private development on public infrastructure. Based on direction from Council through the CFMP and budget process, DOT is working to scale up the number of planting projects. In prior years, DOT had planted roughly a few hundred trees per year. Going forward, the goal is to plant 2,000 trees per year. And to accomplish this increased scope and scale of tree plantings, additional funding was allocated for planting and pruning in last year's budget process. In San Jose, property owners need a permit to remove trees over 38 inches in circumference from single family or duplex lots or of any size on other property types. Otherwise, applicants pay a fee and DOT uses the fee to plant new trees. We had four findings and the first finding is that private property, oh, hold on one second. The first finding was that private property tree removal permitting requires better resources and improved processes. The city requires applicants plant replacements for trees that they remove per the city's replacement ratios. However, planners have not been consistently applying the standard replacement ratios correctly when approving tree removals or development permits. We found that in our sample of 34 permits, we noted errors in nearly one third, resulting in 142 fewer trees planted or about $110,000 in new fees. Currently, planners do not receive standard training nor have instructions on how to apply the replacement ratios or make technical decisions around trees. To ensure that tree removal processes are consistently followed and updated, we recommend PBCE should develop procedures on tree removal permit processing and provide planners with technical guidance about trees or provide further access to certified arborists. We also noted that the tree removal uh, permit fees do not align with the current review process. For a sample of projects, the average time to review a live tree removal was longer than the permit fee recovers. We also should note that recommendations from the CFMP may impact the current process and PBCE plans to review the fee and related processes and we have a recommendation about this as well. The second finding is that the city can better ensure replacement trees are planted in regrowing the canopy. The purpose of the city's replacement ratio is to regrow the canopy after trees removed and as noted earlier when an applicant removes a tree the city prefers the replacement tree is planted on the property. We found the city does not verify the applicants planted required placement trees on their property, and the city does have two methods to verify tree plantings depending on the type of permit, but neither is routinely done. Lastly, the city permits or determines the replacement ratio based on the number of trees removed without counting for the canopy lost, nor does the city provide guidelines for appropriate tree species for planting. To, to ensure replacement trees are appropriately planted to regrow the canopy, we recommend PBCE develop procedures to enact enforce tree planting requirements, and revise the tree replacement policy to incorporate canopy size and provide guidance for tree selection. The third finding is that DOT has not been spending in lieu fees timely, and as described earlier, the city collects an in lieu fee when applicants remove a tree and do not have room to plant a new tree on their property. DOT then uses these revenues to plant trees on the applicant's behalf. We found that DOT has spent just a portion of the in lieu fees collected uh, about uh, between fiscal year 2018-19 and 21-22, the city collected over $1.5 million in fees, but only spent about $88,000. But we do note that the, fee, the funds were spent for planting and watering costs, 
We found that DOT can improve how they track in loopy spending they're also, and provide clear guidelines on where and how to spend it in loopy revenues. So to better spend in loopy revenues, we recommend DOT identify planting locations or uses for accumulated fees, create guidelines for how fees should be spent, and regularly review information on fee collection. Our fourth finding is that DOT should evaluate costs and establish metrics for the Community Forest Met uh, Program's objectives. The city has identified numerous objectives for the Community Forest Program. These include planting 2,000 trees per year, achieving a 20% canopy cover by 2051, and prioritizing tree planting in designated areas of need. Costs of tree planting can vary, but can include costs for procuring and planting the tree, site preparation or traffic safety measures, for example. In one project reviewed, planting occurred on a heavily trafficked street and required lane closures. Watering during the first few years after a tree is planted is also referred to as the establishment period and future maintenance costs. DOT has several potential planting approaches, including city-funded and direct plantings, or engaging private property owners in planting efforts. Different strategies may have different costs and vary in how effectively they meet the different goals of the Community Forest Program. However, city data on tree removals, replacements in tree planting is limited, both in terms of cost and effectiveness, such as survival rates for different planting strategies. To measure how well the city is meeting its objectives, the city should track additional data related to tree planting, removals, costs, and outreach. In addition, metrics would help the city evaluate the cost effectiveness of planting approaches in meeting objectives. To measure how well the city is meeting community forest objectives, we recommend DOT develop metrics and work with TBCE on necessary data collection to measure progress toward the city's tree planting objectives, and work with the Community Forest Advisory Co Committee to develop an outreach plan, as we recognize private property owners will need to be part of the solution to regrow the city's canopy. The report has 10 recommendations to improve the city's processes to protect and grow the community forest. I'd like to thank the Departments of Transportation, Planning, Building, Co Enforcement, Public Works, uh, the City Attorney's Office, and the City Manager's Budget Office. I ask that you accept the report and cross reference to the January 10th meeting of the City Council. And I'll turn it over to the administration for their response. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. John Risto, Director of Transportation. Uh, on behalf of the city administration, just wanted to say thank you to the Joe and the audit team. It was a really a productive process. And I think the findings or recommendations are really gonna help us to make resources much more effective. The recommendations in the report. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the report, Joe, and thank you for the response, John. Sorry uh, to interrupt. The Chamber Zoom is on mute, so we can't hear John. Still on mute. Oh, now it's okay. Can you hear now? I can hear you now, David. Okay. Sure. I can. Um, do, John, you want to do like a brief summary do. recap of what you said? Sure. Uh, John Risso, Director of Transportation, just want to, on behalf of the city administration, thank the audit department for the very productive process and product that came from it. I think we're going to be able to use those recommendations and finding to better manage tree resources throughout the city. And also want to say that we accept and concur with all the findings and recommendations in the report. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the report and the response. Um, we'll go to public comment. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for this report. Um, I think I just want to report out that, uh, you know, there's a lot of good work on the, on this issue of trees done in the past few years. Uh, you know, the issues of a, a tree canopy for the east side has been uh, quite a uh, quite a quite a task to figure out how exactly to to work a tree canopy in the future of the east side. I thank you for the years of work from uh, Councilperson Carrasco on this issue, and uh, just a whole bunch of uh, wrangling, wrestling, and uh, good new re-understandings of issues. Uh, I guess is a way to put it. So so thank you. Um, I was always interested how um, the state California 
Office of Emergency Services was actually a part of the planning for the future of tree issues in San Jose. And I think they can offer some interesting reports and in reporting what to expect of ourselves as a, as a community in the next year and in the next uh, few years and into, into the next decade. I thought I would just mention at this time uh, as a reference for yourselves and uh, thank you again for the work on this issue and that we can continue uh, good practices of more and more trees. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, any of committee colleagues have uh, any questions? Um, if not, I'm going to ask a few. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning. You, you talk about uh, something like 34 permits that you reviewed and that led those 34 permits resulted in um, 142 fewer trees planted or $110,000 in uncollected fees. What is the, what would be the, the total number then permits that um, out, that's 34 out of a total of how many? I don't have that number specifically. You know, one of the challenges we had in looking at, especially the development permits, is understanding the scope of trees removed over time. And so that's why we used a smaller sample. Some of the, the, the selection was based on the availability of the data. Um, I can come back to you on the tree removal permits. We might have a larger number for that. I just don't have it top at my fingers. In terms of the development permits, it's a little harder to get there because it's the, it may not always be easily called out in the amount of data that we're, we were looking at. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just trying to get put a handle on, you know, this is out of these 34 permits, what do we think the total number of, yeah. what the total missed opportunity was? Let's assume this is one-tenth of the permits out there, or is it is that reasonable, or is that, that we're talking about potentially a million dollars in uncollected fees or a thousand, over a thousand trees that weren't planted, right? I, I'm going to have to turn to Chris. Do you have any uh, idea of the, the total number of tree removal permits? Yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Council Member Chris Burton, Director of Planning, Building Code Enforcement. Um, yeah, not off the top of my head, it's certainly something we can follow up with and give you a, yeah. a sense of the scope and scale. And I, I don't really want to spend much time looking back. I guess my point is just is the magnitude of this problem is quite large, and um, we ought to be... I'm glad to see that we now are on the same page. We understand yeah. the problem, and we're going to try to work on that. But yeah. it, it is a larger number. Yeah. That, that, Correct. That's it, what it is a larger number than what we what we, uh, what we reported, but we were just looking at, like I said, a small sample. Right. Thank you, um, John. So there's a it looks like there's about one and a half million dollars almost that's in the fund. Do we have a strategy for how we're going to utilize that? I know we bought got these contracts now with some bigger companies to do more planting and other maintenance. Uh, what other ideas do we have? Thank you, Council Member John Russo, Director of Transportation. So I think the good news is even before the audit started um, last year, we brought through the Community Forest Management Plan, which really outlined all of the same things that we're going to be trying to do here with an increase in level of planting and how we're managing and getting input from uh, other community resources on this. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're glad to see that there is some additional funding for this, and we've already started on locating we're finding locations where we can do the 2,000 tree planting on an annual basis as well as this. So we've started doing that already. So um, I guess the answer is we're on it. And now with those resources like we have here, plus the, I think two weeks ago, we did approve the contract vendors that will assist us with the planting along with our city forest. We're in much better shape to be able to get this done. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I see Council Member Foley has her hand up, so I'll go to her. No, okay, that's fine. Uh, I to offer a comment. Uh, last year or in this fiscal cycle, I got approved a budget to offer tree rebates to residents in the city. Whoever wanted to uh, plant a tree, they could come to the my council office and we would fill out a little bit of forms and then we would give them a rebate of up to $100. So I just wanted to throw that out there and have the public and the community aware that the this pot of money is available. It's not a huge pot, but it's available. And and with that, I will move to accept the report and cross-reference it to the January meeting. Second. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to just follow up on that comment as well. It, it, it occurs to me that this kind of relates to my other question, which is on the tree removal fees that we charge homeowners. I know that there's a question of whether we're covering our fees, right? Whether we're covering our costs with these fees. Is that, that, that's a concern, is that correct? So the question that we brought up was the, 
the, the assumptions within the calculation. And so the assumptions we, you know, looking at the number of hours spent was, wasn't correct. And so the potentially that could affect the, the overall fee. Um, I think ultimately that, you know, has the, the fee setting process is ultimately a policy decision. We were just really talking about the assumptions underneath that, under, uh, underlying the calculation. And we also note that there were some CFMP recommendations that could have some fee impact as well. Those are a little harder to, to uh, kind of get at. But uh, our understanding, what we reported in the report, or what we put in the audit, was that planning, building, code enforcement was going to be looking at that. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I'm concerned. Obviously, I want to make sure we cover our cost. On the flip side, I'm concerned about disincentivizing people from utilizing the system um, for in multiple ways. I mean, I think people don't go get permits when they have a dead tree. or Well, they don't need it for a dead tree as much, but for trees that need removal or trees that are in the, that are roots are damaging something or whatever it is. Um, and I want to make sure that we're not disincentivizing as much as we are uh, assisting the process. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we, in theory, we could consider some of these leftover fees to help maybe offset the cost for residents so that they are helped in doing this process correctly so we have a better handle on what's going on out in the city. Maybe a conversation for us later as we bring this back to council next month, but I was trying to think about ways we can utilize that money but also get better cooperation from our residents. We do often hear from residents too about the cost just to maintain their street trees and how difficult it is for them when they have to trim or remove or repair sidewalks, et cetera. So I think we ought to think collectively about how we might utilize the funds we have to better manage this overall process. Um, so I look forward to the conversation in January. I think we're going to have a lot of interesting things to talk about. Um, and then we, with that, we have a motion on the floor, so we'll take a vote. Foley? Aye. Esparza? Cohen? Aye. And Davis? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Now we're moving on to... Can you please mark me yeah. as yes? Thanks. Sorry. No, no problem. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item D2, our municipal regional stormwater permit reissuance report. Um, we carry are you board? Thank you. Good afternoon, Carrie Romano, Environmental Services. Um, I'm joined uh, by Rajni Nair with ESD and Mary Morse also with, uh, with ESD. Um, I'll kick us off today. Um, you know, this presentation is really to provide an overview of the Municipal Regional Stormwater or NPDES permit, um, which applies to all of the city. Um, you know, I think when we look at the requirements, um, you know, we can understand where they come from. If you look at our waterways, you can see that they're not um, as healthy as, uh, as they could be. And so, you know, the rules are really amended and to focus on improving water quality and, uh, and preserving the health of this critical natural resource. Um, from an organizational standpoint, ESD's role in this process is to provide um, interpretation and regulatory uh, advice to city departments, but the real work and the hard, the hard part of making this happen is really done by departments across the city. So just know that we're here talking about it today, but um, there's uh, folks across, across city departments that are really um, strategizing on how best to implement this. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rajni. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee and public. Uh, my name is Rajni Nair, Deputy Director of Environmental Services Department. Uh, in today's presentation, we'll provide you an update on the Municipal Regional Stormwater NPDES permit, uh, commonly known as the stormwater permit, uh, that it was recently issued. But first, uh, I'll share some background as to why this permit uh, exists. Uh, the city of San Jose has two separate uh, sewer systems, like most cities, with the exception of San Francisco, which is a combined system. Uh, the sanitary sewer system, uh, on, shown on the slide, is a series of connected pipes that discharge into the regional wastewater facility, where contaminants are removed and the water is treated. Then eventually, clean water is discharged into the bay. For the city storm sewer system, that is not the case. Uh, we have approximately 1,700 outfalls that discharge directly into our creeks, 
untreated. Uh, as a city, our work concentrates on preventing water pollution from entering both the sanitary and storm sewer systems. Both systems are federally regulated. To ensure water, oops, well, I'll go back one. Let's see. There you go. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, to ensure uh, water is treated before it goes into our, the waterways under the Federal Clean Water Act, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit, that uh, NPDES uh, for short, was created for that purpose. The NPDES permits administered here in California are unique in comparison to the rest of the country. The US EPA authorizes the State Water Resource Control Board to administer these permits, which dates back to a 1968 uh, Port of Cologne Act. Um, and keep in mind, this was prior to the Clean Water Act that became law in 1972. Uh, the State Water Resource Control Board is divided into nine regions based on watersheds throughout the state. For our area, highlighted in the blue circle on the left of this slide, is called the Region 2 San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board, which includes Santa Clara, Alameda, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and Solano counties. The MPDS permit for storm sewer system was relatively recent, uh, since the 1990s, in comparison to industrial and treatment plants, which were heavily regulated decades before. Based on data and research, Storm sewer systems through the state contribute pollution and harming our waterways, as Carrie mentioned. This permit typically is a five-year permit term, with the exception of the last one, which was extended two years ago. The latest stormwater permit has been reissued and is effective as of July 1st, 2022. Both Mary and I will focus on some of the specifics with the new permit. So in this slide, uh, the stormwater permit essentially requires all 180 square miles of the city of San Jose to comply, which is in effect, there are several key city departments listed on this slide, responsible to implement and to protect our storm sewer and waterways, as required under the various provisions also listed on the far left. E since the last two permits, new provisions have been added to address impacts with unsheltered homeless populations, cost reporting and asset management. That will be discussed towards the end of this presentation. So now I'll pass to Mary. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee and public. My name is Mary Morse. I'm a Senior Environmental Program Manager with Environmental Services Department. The stormwater permit directs the city to effectively prohibit polluted stormwater discharges from our storm sewer system and creeks. The various permit provisions detail specific actions, milestones, and programs that the city must implement to achieve this compliance. Provision C3 focuses on new and redevelopment projects. The new stormwater permit, like past permits, focused on installing and utilizing green stormwater infrastructure, or GSI, to manage polluted st stormwater runoff. For those who may be new to the concept, GSI is a treatment system for stormwater runoff, which removes sediments and other pollutants before the runoff enters the storm sewer system and eventually our creeks and the bay. Examples of GSI can be seen in the photos on the right of this slide. For commercial, municipal, and multi-dwelling units, the past permit required new and redevelopments that created or replaced 10,000 square feet or more impervious service to be treated. The new permit now requires any new or redevelopment that creates or replaces 5,000 square feet or more impervious service to be treated. Single family homes had been exempted from GSI requirements in previous permits. The new stormwater permit requires GSI on single family homes that create or replace 10,000 square feet or more of impervious surface. Roadway projects, particularly maintenance projects, were exempted from GSI requirements in the past, unless they created a new, a new lane of travel. The new stormwater permit requires requirements now apply to any roadway project that includes work down to the base and creates or replaces one acre or more of impervious surface. And lastly, the stormwater permit requires each city to implement GSI. San Jose is required to build a minimum of five acres, which we will easily meet with the River Oaks Regional Project. So what do all these new requirements mean for us citywide? Roughly, the new permit will require approximately 58% more commercial, municipal, and multifamily residential properties to comply with the new stormwater permit if they plan to develop or redevelop. 
The new requirement on single family homes means that all new and redevelopment projects that exceed 10,000 square feet of impervious surface will need to comply with C3 requirements. And these new requirements must be implemented starting July 1st, 2023. The provision C10, trash load reduction, details specific actions the city must take to comply with the stormwater permits discharge prohibitions and to address trash in our storm sewer system and waterways. Actions done to comply with C10 are meant to ensure that our creeks don't, like, don't look like the picture of Coyote Creek we see on the top right. The stormwater permit requires the city to achieve 90% trash load reduction compared to our 2009 baseline by, July, by June 30th of this fiscal year. We are also required to achieve 100% trash load reduction by June of 2025. We are on track to achieve this through a combination of structural controls installed in the storm sewer system, such as the large trash capture device shown in the bottom right photo, creek cleanups and other trash control measures, and the direct discharge program, which needs to be updated next month. However, after June of 2025, we will no longer be able to claim credits for creek cleanups or for the direct discharge program. So the city will need to implement new or additional controls to make up that 25% credit shortfall. Proposed trash controls will be included in the city's revised long-term trash plan, which will be submitted with the fiscal year 22-23 stormwater annual report. A new requirement in C10 pertains to private lands. This requirement applies to all private parcels that meet the following criteria. They are connected directly to the city's storm sewer system, meaning they have at least one storm drain on site that is plumbed to the city's storm sewer system, as explained in the graphic on the bottom left. They also must be in an area that is not treated by full trash capture device. And uh, they must be in an area of the city with moderate, high, or very high trash generating levels. These private parcels must install a full trash capture system or implement equivalent trash control measures by July 1st, 2025. City staff are currently analyzing how many parcels this requirement applies to and are working with partners to develop guidance on how to comply with this requirement. The city's direct discharge program focuses on trash and pollutants in the waterways generated by the encampments and the actions of people experiencing homelessness. The city was the first to implement a direct discharge plan back in 2016, and the new stormwater permit requires us to update that plan by January of 2023. The stormwater permit requires specific updates to the direct discharge trash control plan, which are related to a brand new provision in this permit called C-17, discharges associated with unsheltered homeless populations. As I mentioned before, we are required to submit our updated plan to the Water Board by January 2023, and that plan will go to Council on December 13th. The updated plan reflects the current partnerships between Housing, PRNS's Beautify SJ program, ESD, and outside partners such as our nonprofits, Valley Water, and the County of Santa Clara. The new C-17 provision includes the following major highlights. The city must develop a plan and a commitment to address the needs of our unhoused community living within waterways and to address any polluted discharges generated by those populations that may impact water quality. The C-17 provision also requires the city to prioritize housing and services for those living near waterways, as the unhoused population is by far the largest source of trash in our waterways. And lastly, C-17 requires the city to provide an estimate of the number of people experiencing homelessness that live in the waterways and within 500 feet of a creek edge. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Reggie. Thanks, Mary. Uh, provision C-12, polychlorinated biphenyls, which is PCBs, is another provision in the stormwater department. And this has evolved the most and is more complex in comparison to the uh, other provisions that, in the new permit. Uh, which are, uh, and what are PCBs in particular? I mean, these are chemicals used in various industrial and commercial applications such as electrical and hydraulic equipment or plasticizers and paints. Uh, these were domestically manufactured in the late 1920s and banned in the late 1970s. It is a legacy pollutant that has been prevalent in sediment within our waterways since the 1950s and is not evenly distributed around the bay, as you can see in the map shown on the top right. There is a goal set forth by the Water Board to reduce the amount of PCBs entering into, uh, through the storm sewer system and into the San Francisco Bay through four specific programs listed on this slide. The first program identifies properties, which are known as source properties, that have high concentrations of PCBs and control it on the property itself. 
It will require notification to the Water Board and may require city resources to perform operations and maintenance work, such as inline pipe or inlet pipe cleaning or inlet cleaning near these source properties. And to date, we've identified nine of these properties. Second program focuses on old industrial areas. In Santa Clara County, there is about 600 acres of old industrial areas and about half of that falls within City of San Jose's jurisdiction. The goal of this program is to create a plan and schedule as to how the city will address these source properties that may have some concentration, but no clear evidence as to where the source of uh, PCBs are located. This may entail similar actions as the first program, but also engineered structural control systems like large trash capture or green infrastructure may need to be implemented. The city needs to submit a plan by March 31st, 2023. The third program, this was the, uh, noted in the last permit, but now has additional requirements for the building, building demolition program. Starting in July 1st, 2023, the permit requires more notification to the Water Board and the EPA prior to any demolition work for buildings older than 1980. Inspections and manifests showing where the material is disposed will be required. And lastly, requiring controls of PCBs for any bridge or overpass work when repaired or replaced. So currently, uh, what has been done to date, city staff in partnership with a countywide consortium uh, that the city co-chairs with Valley Water called the Santa Clara Valley Urban Runoff Pollution Prevention Program are evaluating properties that have been de redeveloped future projects that are planned to address other provisions in the permit, such as green infrastructure and large trash capture, versus where remaining old industrial areas are not treated. And that's shown in yellow in that small map you can see on the far right um, for reference. The challenge with implementing something large scale like a regional project takes time and money. Um, also, it may not be a conducive solution since the location of industrial, old industrial areas are scattered throughout the city. For example, as a point of reference, uh, under the permit, the city will be implementing the River Oaks regional, um, uh, regional project, as Mary mentioned. And this is a treatment area for about 210 acres, and the estimated cost is about 13 million, and it could take up to four years uh, from conceptual to construction. So uh, bottom line, uh, we, we need to be creative in leveraging the multi-purpose benefit in addressing PCBs and minimizing future capital and operation maintenance costs. Finally, uh, there are the remaining provisions that are either updated or new requirements. For provision C15, uh, this is basically pertaining to fire activities and how water, including potable water, is managed uh, during and after a fire event. The Water Board is requiring fire departments throughout the Bay Area to participate in a regional working group twice a year throughout the permit term to further evaluate how to balance fire safety needs while protecting storm sewer system and waterways. The last two provisions, C20 and C21, are new. Uh, the Water Board is very interested in knowing how much all this is going to cost, and regionally, all counties will be developing a framework to unify how this information will be collected and tracked. This will be new work for all responsible departments here at the city to comply. And then asset management is essentially the goal is to really just be more visible and transparent about the work that we're doing to help improve our waterways. So for next steps, uh, we will be seeking council approval on December 13, 2022 for the direct discharge trash control program as Mary mentioned, uh, that is specific as to how we manage trash in our waterways. This will be submitted to the Water Board on January 3rd, 2023. For old industrial areas, we will be submitting a PCB sediment control measures plan and schedule to the Water Board on March 31st, 2023. Within this fiscal year, we will come back to Council to update municipal codes that reflect the new stormwater permit requirements. So this concludes our presentation. I'll hand it back to Carrie. That was a lot, thank you. Uh, so we're ready for questions. All right, thank you, uh, Rajani and Mary and Carrie for the report. Um, a lot of work done and a lot of work ahead, so I, I appreciate that. We'll go to public comment first. Blair Beekman. 
Hi, Larry Beekman here. I forgot to add on the previous item that also, you know, about the about tree issues that also can be applicable for uh, this issue. Um, you know, we, we have some really good plans in store for ourselves for 2024 and 25. And what we can't be working on in 2023, uh, 2024 and 25 can be really hopeful years, I think, for the future of trees. I think for the future of uh, how you talked about this program today, it's just a matter that we work our good practices in this upcoming year uh, that can really uh, lead to a good good place in 24 and 25. Uh, thanks for your time. Back to the committee. Okay. Are there any questions from any my fellow committee members? Okay. If not, um, just one quick question. The the we a couple weeks ago we had a discussion at the council meeting about these um, sewer separation system Caltrans was helping fund. Is that is, is that something that's related to this? Was it required by this or just something separate? I think it's related to Caltrans contribution, uh, financial contribution to the, so each, each agency has a role in contributing to the um, health improvement of our waterways. And this was Caltrans financial contribution to help us do all of this work. Did I miss anything? That was about putting in um, trash capture at uh, the discharge locations, right? So, yes. And, so similar and that's to us. Part of, that's one of the requirements is, is for us to have to do yeah. that across the city. And so it makes sense we partner on those things. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Is, uh, oh, Council Member Spars, I see your hand up now. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. So uh, one, in terms of working with our business districts, um, are we, where are we in talking to the businesses that, uh, about what's coming their way? So I'll start and then Regine, if you can add. So, um, most, if not all of the permit requirements are for new development. And so as the new development, uh, begin discussions with the city, we, we talk about kind of what the new requirements for any, any city project is. Um, but we've also done a bit of outreach and notification on the web page so that folks understand um, as they begin to contemplate new projects um, how, how the many uh, regulatory and developmental rules might change. But Rajni, what would you add to that? Um, just, just to add, uh, during the permit, uh, as it was being uh, revised, you know, there was multiple opportunities where we did reach out to the local businesses, just to inform them and new de uh, and developers, just of all the the various provisions that are being implemented. But also, um, currently, we have been meeting, like for example, San Jose Management um, Downtown Association. We've been meeting with them just to let them know some of these provisions that might be impacting their day-to-day -day operations. Um, specifically, have you, so when we talk about old industrial areas and looking at the map, um, that's actually uh, portions of District 7. Um, if you look at some of the areas that are impacted, have you reached out to uh, businesses down there? Because I, I haven't heard of that, so I'm, I'm unaware of the businesses in that area being contacted? Right, right now, we're really at the infancy stage of this, so we haven't identified, other than the nine properties uh, that have been contributing to high levels of PCBs, but that, that's the extent of it. Um, the, the second part of that program, which is a larger scale, that 300 acres, uh, that's a portion we're still in the planning stage. So we will, and we are working closely with uh, Office of Economic Development and uh, Public Works on that. Okay, thank you. And then um, I have uh, another question, you know, it'll be for the future council um, to really, uh, you know, do a lot of this work. When we look at prioritizing folks that live within 500 feet of waterways, uh, what does that do to some of the other, let me, let me step back. It has taken multiple departments, excuse me, <clears throat> multiple departments at the city uh, to work on Columbus Park, for example, right? And then, uh, and then we're looking at uh, waterways within the city, which 
are a much larger region. Um, how are we going to prioritize folks living on waterways and have we analyzed what that means for the rest of the city um, and the impacts to the rest of the city and have we sort of done an analysis around the types of multi-departmental resources that this will take and establish sort of a, 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 an estimate dollar figure? Thank you. You know, the, as you point out, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different departments and, and a lot of internal and sta external stakeholders engaged in this. And you know, the real answer is we don't know yet. Um, we are working uh, for the direct discharge plan submittal, but this is um, this is a regulatory mandate that we must prioritize uh, the unhoused along the waterways. Um, as I think we mentioned, or, or we'll mention more next week. Um, the unhoused contribute about 80% of the pollution to our waterways. So, um, so the mandate sort of makes sense when you look at the science and you know how we how we figure out the uh, each component to that is something that we're still working on. But it is something that we need to comply with to ensure that our waterways um, are improved. You know, all of the work from green infrastructure to um, to trash capture devices, et cetera, are all designed to improve the health of our waterways. And if the unhoused are contributing the largest component to the, um, to the unhealthiness of the creeks, then uh, we do need to prioritize it. But, um, but we are all working together and, and frankly struggling with uh, competing priorities for that. Um, and I think as we continue to finalize our plans with this new overlay of prioritization, um, I'm confident that we'll get there. Um, you know, there's probably going to need to be some more money, as with any new requirement, and that's something that we'll work through the budget process. But, um, but for better or worse, it is something that is a mandate that we must comply with. And are we working with partner agencies, both at the local and the state level, around the the funding, I, I, I fully recognize that we do not have a dollar figure yet because there's a tremendous amount of work that goes to that, but are we having those discussions with partner agencies that, um, that can help, that we can jointly pay for these types of solutions, which are very expensive? Well, I'll start, and Reagan, if you, if you want to add anything. You know, the housing department has done a, an amazing job of working with everyone on how to fund these these efforts and um, and this is a new layer on top of that which makes their work even even more challenging. And Reagan I think has some more. Thanks Reagan Henninger with the housing department. I would just add we have explicitly brought up this requirement to um, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development to the US Interagency Council on Homelessness and to the state Cal ICH, um, just bringing it to their attention that there is this um, new priority or um, requirement. And um, have we had conversations with um, the water district and with the governor's office, um, again, other agencies that we can jointly uh, fund potential solutions with? We have brought it up to the state. Um, as far as Valley Water, uh, they're certainly aware of this and have been in conversations with us. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. I, I think this is going to cost a lot of money and um, as a city on January 31st, uh, the council will need to make some uh, choices about where to lobby and um, some really difficult financial uh, decisions um, in the coming year related to this. Um, with that, I will move to accept this report and refer it for the full council consideration on January 31st. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Move to vote. Foley? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. And Davis? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
So we're moving on to D3, the City Initiatives Roadmap Regional Transportation Activities Semi-Annual Report. I think John and Jessica are here, or do I see John? I don't know if Jess is here. Oh, oh, Jess is on Zoom. So, and also somebody from VTA is presenting, but we'll let uh, John start. Bernice is online too, right? Yeah, okay. Thank you, John Risto, Director of Transportation again. And we do have a presentation with two different presenters. I think Bernice Alanis with VTA is on Zoom. And Neil Ong of MyStep is gonna do the second part of that. So if we're teed up, I th think we're ready to go. Okay, go ahead, Bernice. Hi, welcome members of the Transportation and Environment Committee. I'm um, pleased to be able to present some updates on the BART Silicon Valley program. Um, we've been in a very close partnership with all our partners at City of San Jose, um, working collaboratively to move this project forward. So I think we're ready for the next slide. We can go into the first slide of the presentation. Thank you. Just wanted to give you a, a brief overview of the project, um, a reminder of um, the elements of the project. It's a six mile extension um, starting at the recently completed Berryessa extension. Five miles of that extension are in a subway tunnel, which we're utilizing the single bore tunnel. One mile is uh, at street level. There are, we call them a three underground stations, but they're really above ground stations. And we call them underground because you board at the platform level underground. We have one station at street level that's in Santa Clara, but all three of the San Jose stations you're boarding underground. And then we have um, right now, currently uh, in the scope are two mid tunnel facilities. That's part of the innovations. Um, so we're not sure if those will remain. Um, they're looking at, uh, innovations with ventilation. And then we have our new hall yard and maintenance facility in the city of Santa Clara. Next slide, please. One of the major efforts that we're working on right now is our uh, construction outreach management program, specifically our CTMP. And I'll um, go over some of the details of that. But in our construction outreach management program, we have our education and outreach plan. That is the basic guiding principles for how we engage with key stakeholders in the public. It really is, uh, it identifies um, levels and tiers of stakeholders like one, two, and three, if they're directly um, adjacent to the project activities, whether they're fairly close or maybe commuting through basically impacted by uh, any kind of um, changes to any type of mobility, uh, whether they're biking, walking, or in an auto. And um, then we have just, I shouldn't say just, but the general public. So we classify them and then we look at all the means and methods and the best ways to communicate with those um, different levels of stakeholders and the timing. Um, what we're gonna go into some detail today is our construction transportation management plan. And that looks at how um, we basically, uh, once we have means and methods defined by the um, contractors, um, how we coordinate with circulation and access needs, um, basically to and from the construction areas and around adjacent. Um, and an element of that also is the emergency services coordination plan. And that's basically making sure that during construction that the um, time for emergency responses is not impacted and that um, the access for those emergency services is not impact during construction. Next slide, please. So the purpose of our construction transportation management plan, as um, I said, is to coordinate access for all modes during construction. So we're looking at, um, at, at the bike paths, we're looking at the sidewalks, we're looking at the roadways and streets. Um, we want to be able to minimize and reduce to the extent possible, and that um, is what I wanna emphasize, reduce to the extent possible construction-related transportation impacts. And basically it's a very, very careful balancing act. It is how do you keep the project moving at the same time minimizing those impacts. So um, I'll give you an example on our um, phase one project. We were looking at some areas 
where um, we went out to the public and said, we can close this road for six months all the way closed, or we can leave it partially open for a year and do some changes, right? And, and that's where we can get that input from the public. Like, do you want a bigger impact maybe for a lesser time or maybe um, a less significant sort of change in the way you move, but maybe for a, um, a longer duration. So those are the types of things that we're going to be sort of weighing on. Um, we'll first vet these things with our partners and then we bring it to the public and I'll go over some details on the process for that. Um, one thing that the CTMP is not is um, it is not um, a mechanism to really sort of halt any or impede construction and uh, totally eliminate travel and access disruptions. We, it's just not possible to build a project of this magnitude or, or any, any significant project without some type of um, changes occurring in the way people move about the project. So next slide, please. So we are in the uh, Construction Transportation Management Plan. Um, we're calling them CP2, and we are going to be doing several of those. Right now we're developing and we've had two meetings, I think to date with the city of San Jose and actually a joint meeting with the city of Santa Clara because one of our first areas of work is going to be where both of those cities merge together or are adjacent to each other. So the first part of uh, putting together these plans for the traffic um, plan is the coordination with the cities and our stakeholders and our partners. Uh, we will have the contractor uh, develop a draft plan we in our master agreements did very high level principles, but until the contractor really knows how they're going to go about delivering this process, this project with means and methods, we couldn't really uh, spell out any of the specificity needed for this plan. So we're now at that point. The contractor has much more of an idea and uh, of the upcoming work in some specific areas. And now they're presenting their draft plan. We'll be working with uh, the city and other stakeholders to get input on that draft plan. Once we've come with a plan that we feel is ready for presentation, we're gonna be taking that and engaging the public at general and we'll get their further input. And then the last process will be for this first uh, CT, CP2 Pacific plan. Um, we're gonna be taking it to the San Jose City Council. So it's gonna be about a 16 week process. Um, for all of the reviews, input, and then coming up with the final plan for the city council approval. We will be doing, and I think we can go to the next slide. We will be doing several of these CTMPs. So they are really um, geared towards the contract and specific geographical areas. And that way we can really focus in and get the, um, feedback from um, those like level one stakeholders that I mentioned and make sure that they're engaged and we can focus on uh, the uh, movement and travel patterns in that area. So right now we have plans for five um, uh, construction transportation management plans, but we are looking at maybe even subdividing some of those in some of the station areas based on um, the specific work areas and the design packages in the contract. Because we want to make sure that these plans um, can be fluent and that in some cases, especially like at Deridon Station in downtown, that we're coordinating with some of the other development that's occurring um, and with some of the other key stakeholders. So next slide, please. Next major effort is our business resource program. And in that program, um, really it's about um, preparing and helping to minimize the construction um, related disturbances specifically to small businesses. Um, by the nature of what we're doing with this project with the single bore tunnel, it really did reduce the level of surface impacts, but it doesn't totally eliminate them. There will be um, some activity happening on, on the streets and on the sidewalks. And so we wanna make sure through this plan that we can ensure uh, visibility and access during construction. And then we also have an environmental commitment that we develop this um, business resource program. So those are the goals for the program. Next slide, please. So the first part of the uh, business resource program, and it's really small business resource program, um, we did a lot of analysis. Um, we worked actually with the city of San Jose Office of Economic Development. Uh, we uh, surveyed businesses. We needed to really find out what was the nature of these businesses? How were their customers accessing them? Things have really changed, especially in this COVID-related world. Lots of businesses have already become much more um, 
communicative uh, virtually and do quite a bit of e-commerce, but um, there are a significant number of businesses that, that for sure definitely rely on walk-in traffic. So we looked at this. We've also engaged a consultant that put together the small resource program for the LA Metro project. And it was a significant program. And they worked and engaged many of the small businesses to participate in the program. So we're taking their analysis and we put together, we have a draft plan right now. And in our draft plan, we have four elements of that plan and they include signage and wayfinding. And that is that element we talked about in the goals of ensuring um, business access to these small businesses. Uh, doing um, some marketing, shop local marketing campaigns will utilize uh, some of the mechanism and fencing and signage that we have as part of the project and other VTA resources. Also some technical support for these businesses through some, uh, some uh, community-based organizations and both uh, other resources to help a small business perhaps build a website, um, help with some of the um, advertising vehicles they, they may not um, be familiar with. And then we have um, one last key element and that would be uh, potential financial resources such as a business interruption fund. And that would be very much not a one size fits all. These small businesses that would be, uh, I would say a disproportionately or more significantly impacted would be those uh, eligible for the business interruption fund. And there are specific criteria that's being developed for that. Um, and the reason we're at the point we are right now and we will be presenting the final draft is that once again, those means and methods really determine um, what our approach will be both for traffic management and this business resources program. Next slide, please. So the next steps, as I mentioned, we're working on that draft plan. We plan to present to the city council early of 2023. Um, sometime in the first quarter. And then we'll finalize the development and begin implementing the business research program. Uh, the timing will coincide with our, uh, we have some early construction works happening in 2023, but for sure everything will be in place for the major construction activities in 2024. And I believe that is my last slide. Let me see. Oh, station refinements. I'm sorry. Let me give you an update on that. Uh, back in May, um, the board requested that we explore and uh, make public the findings of a uh, station refinement effort um, with the goals looking at enhancing the access to the stations and both the passenger experience within the stations. Um, we uh, have gone through a four month process on that. Um, the goals being to improve connectivity and access, improve the passenger experience and circulation and also optimize TOD. Um, we had some constraints with this, and that was to uh, look at these possible uh, station refinements within the timelines determined by the Federal Transit Administration, and to um, look at what we could do uh, in the currently approved project, um, not um, impacting the project as related to uh, significant cost increases or schedule increases. Next slide, please. So I wanted to go over that process, as I mentioned, it's um, been basically uh, an effort that we've been working on since May, very um, comprehensively uh, over the summer. Uh, we began with stakeholder engagement and met with our key partners, um, City of San Jose and both SPUR, and looked at what those goals of the, pro pro um, of the station refinement effort were that I just uh, discussed with you about enhancing passenger experience and access to the stations. We had a series of seven workshops focusing on each of the individual station areas and different elements of transit oriented development. We currently are right now in the process of technical feasibility evaluation. We're looking at both, uh, can this be delivered um, by the contractors? Um, what are the costs? What would the impacts be to the schedule? What are the implications environmentally? And what is that potential TOD and uh, the opportunity for uh, any development that it would enable to actually be feasible for a developer? Once we've um, advanced those, we had initially planned to present that maybe in December, but we are still working on um, really looking at uh, some of the more uh, intricacies and maybe the cost benefit um, 
of each of these um, proposed um, station refinements. And once we've got that level of detail, we will be um, presenting to the VTA board uh, for feedback. And then we will um, take that feedback and those would be the innovations that we would actually incorporate into the project. And I think now that is my last slide. And I apologize for forgetting. And happy, I don't know if this is question and answer time, happy to answer any questions should you have them. Uh, thanks, Bernice. This is John Russo again. I think what we're going to do is finish up the other presentation with Neil and then um, offer to have questions. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, Chair, Committee, and members of the public. Today I'll be showcasing the exciting progress that has been made on two of our regional projects that are currently in construction, the 1-1 Blossom Hill and 1-1 Trimble de la Cruz. Um, before I start, just want to emphasize the goals that our team has when it comes to implementing all our projects. Um, first goal is to modernize our existing infrastructure that weren't originally designed to handle the growth occurring in our city. Um, second, freeways have acted as major barriers between communities, um, businesses, schools, and recreation. So we want to change that perception by providing safe and direct connections through our interchanges. Um, third, providing connections to our trails and bike ped network in which the gaps typically occur at the interchanges due to the old designs being more car centric. Um, this leads us to the last goal of utilizing complete street design standards on our interchanges and if feasible, full separation from vehicles for bikes, peds, as will be seen with our two projects. Um, the first project is the US 101 Blossom Hill Interchange located in South San Jose. Uh, the main improvements include constructing a class one bike ped path along the north side of the interchange to connect Sanders Crossing in the west to Coyote Creek Trail in the east. Um, we're also widening the vehicular bridge to accommodate additional lane in each direction and make room for the bike ped path on the bridge. Um, lastly, we modified the on and off ramp intersections and the Monterey Blossom Hill intersection for better traffic operations and multimodal connectivity. So this project started construction back in September 2020 and has progressed the past two years with the completion of the major construction for the bike ped undercrossing and overcrossing structures and the vehicular overcrossing structure as will be seen with the next couple of slides. Um, the first set of pictures are the construction progress from beginning to completion of the two bike ped undercrossing structures. Um, this was designed for bikes and peds to go underneath both the on and off ramps instead of conflicting with um, vehicles at the intersection. Um, the next set of pictures show the construction progress from beginning to completion of the bike ped overcrossing bridge over the on-ramp. Again, this was to design to have bikes and peds go over so that vehicles trying to enter northbound 101 won't conflict with them. Uh, last set of pictures showed the widening of the vehicular bridge structure to provide additional lanes and make room for the bike ped path separated by the concrete barrier. Um, previously, there were two separate bridge structures with empty space in the middle, so the project filled in the gap with a new structure. Um, with the major construction completed, we celebrated the ribbon cutting ceremony on November 18th with our partners at VTA, Caltrans, consultants, contractors, and former city staff. We also had our elected state and local officials attend as guests, speakers, and attendees, which include former council member of District 2 and current state assembly member Ash Cara, uh, city mayor Sam Licardo, and current council member Sergio Jimenez of um, District 2. Lastly, we also had members of the nearby community, the Coyote Creek Neighborhood Association at the celebration, who are the main beneficiaries of this project and were very supportive from the beginning. Uh, 
Although we completed the major construction aspects of the project, there are still some work to be done. Um, unfortunately, there was a delay in the fabrication of the visual screens that provide privacy for the homes that run behind the overcrossing. So we put temporary fencing with slats as we wait for the final product to be installed. Um, landscaping is still being done throughout the project, both uh, state and city right away. And lastly, we need to activate the modified and new signals at the intersection of Monterey and Blossom Hill. Um, we anticipate completion of the remaining work um, by early 2023 with an extra year for the plant establishment period. Um, next project is the US 101 Trimble de la Cruz interchange uh, located in the North San Jose next to the airport and border of city and county of Santa Clara. Um, the main improvements include constructing a class one bike ped path along the north side of the interchange using the same elements as Blossom Hill. Uh, this will connect the Guadalupe River trail system at the east to De La Cruz Boulevard and Central Expressway in the west. We're also reconfiguring the existing three quadrant cloverleaf interchange to a partial cloverleaf interchange for better traffic operations along the interchange. We're also replacing the existing vehicular overcrossing bridge, which doesn't meet current standards with a wider bridge to add additional lane and structural support for the bike ped facility. And lastly, we're modifying the local street intersections to improve operational and uh, multimodal connectivity. Um, so this project broke ground in September 2021 and has been progressing with most of the work concentrated on the bridge. Um, the bridge is actually being built into two phases in order to avoid closing the full overcrossing for traffic by constructing the north side of the bridge first as highlighted and keeping the existing bridge on the south open for traffic. Uh, once the north side of the bridge is completed, we will shift traffic onto the newly built North Bridge while they demolish the existing bridge and construct the new south side of the bridge. Um, the next slide will show the progress of the head bike undercrossing structure and the um, vehicular overcrossing structure. Um, so the first image on the top left shows the progress of the bike ped path that goes underneath the on and off ramp with the, but with the abutments currently constructed. Um, the final product will be exactly like the 101 Blossom Hill undercrossing. And then the next three images you see are the progress of the north side um, vehicular bridge. So I'm not sure if this will play a video. Hopefully. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, anyways, there was a quick time collapse that we were hoping to show to you all, but that was prepared by VTA and their team that shows a four night period in August in which uh, several 75 foot beams were lifted in place as the main supports for the new north side bridge. Um, this north side of the bridge is expected to be completed by early next year for traffic to switch over so that the existing bridge can be demolished and the construction of the new south bridge can begin. Uh, the whole project is expected to be completed by 2025 with work also being on the bike ped path with the undercrossing structure as well as modifications of the local intersections. And with that, that concludes our presentation and we're happy to take your feedback or questions. Thank you, uh, Bernice and Neil for the presentation. Um, those are great projects. I'm looking forward to the uh, Trimble 101 project coming to completion. It's gonna be great for North San Jose. I'm thinking about something similar on the east side when, when we're talking about the connection from San Jose to Santa Clara bike with safe bike routes. We need something like that over on 680 side. Maybe the Montague 880 uh, interchange will give us that opportunity. Okay, let's go to questions from the public. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I wish we could ask questions. I wish the questions from the public, not from our representatives, but from the public were legitimized. But they're not. I can't ask them a direct question to where it would elicit a direct answer. And, and there's a problem with that because these tax dollars that are being used for these bridges, you see, the Chicano experience with respect to transportation is very different than the Anglo experience because you tore up our neighborhoods. Sasi Puedes to the horseshoe ran right through them. 
Okay, and so what that means is, is that the power structure here in San Jose continues, continues to exploit the land and the resources and the tax dollars in order to fortify whatever it is that they have decided, what you have decided, should be the best benefit for my life. But yet you accept no input. You accept no ability for me to ask them direct questions. And that is not democracy. You people do not represent me, nor do you represent the interests of the Chicano communities that have been impacted by transportation issues. Two burial grounds, one in South San Jose when the 85 was being built, and then the VTA running the light rail. Two native Ohlone burial grounds just dug up. What do you guys do? Oh, that's okay. We'll just bring in and call in the elders. They'll come in, they'll do their ceremonies, and we're going to breeze right through that. That's the kind of cavalier attitude that this city has. And it, and it disrespects it disrespects the very people whose lives are impacted by those transportation decisions. And you don't accept any kind of input from us. So that, what that means is that these meetings are a sham. They're a sham and a perversion of democracy. They're, they're, they are a version of democracy, but not democracy itself, because democracy is a power of the people and by the people that serve. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the words of Paul about the concepts of uh, always wanting to consider open democracy. Um, I, uh, for this item, to speak of open democracy, uh, this, uh, the, the VTA, they have a, uh, their, B, their board of directors public meeting at the beginning uh, Thursday of each month. Uh, they just had their December meeting this past week and there were issues, each item, uh, each, each month now, uh, this fall, they've been addressing issues of uh, um, uh, the BART extension and, and the eminent domain issues and, 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 and the purchasing of land for the homes in the area and uh, or, or businesses and buildings. And there was just simply some really beautiful buildings over on the corner of uh, Third and Santa Clara that they uh, claimed that they were gonna own and tear down uh, to make way for the BART. And these were very nice buildings. I hope that it's gotten a bit of press and that uh, it can be reconsidered how to work around these. I mean, old buildings in San Jose should be a treasure and uh, good luck to address that issue. Uh, and this will be an ongoing item four issue uh, in VOD meetings uh, for the next few months, I think. Good luck on how to work on that. And to speak simply to um, the future of transportation issues, uh, I didn't speak at that meeting, I wish I did, about the importance of uh, learning how to centralize the future of light rail service for transportation issues in the future of the area. Um, by centralizing and making it the focus of, of, of Santa Clara County Transit, we can then have uh, buses that radi radiate around the uh, light rail transit stops. And that creates a different form of transportation that we need a bit of inspiration. I'll talk more later on this item. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands from my colleagues. I have one question for Bernice. Uh, it's actually, I think, a similar uh, to what uh, Blair just raised. But um, at the, on between 89 and 97 Santa Clara Street, there's a building where there's supposed to be ventilation and uh, some surface entry points, to, but not a station. Um, was, the, what, is there, was there discussion about how that can be located without having to use that, that building? I mean, I know that probably happened at VTA meeting, but can you give me a little more information about the considerations around that property? Yeah, there was there was extensive discussion, um, and uh, there was a resolution of necessity that the board voted on. I, I think you said ninety seven Santa Clara Street, if I heard you correctly, right? So um, all of the properties, um, you know, there's extensive analysis. Um, they were evaluated in the environmental document, and then further analysis. Um, but I just want to emphasize, like that, that is. Um, a process that's handled through VTA's real estate department and they work very closely. They have uh, federal requirements for relocation plans and just compensation. So I just wanna emphasize that. Um, 
that they do work with uh, if there's a business in a location or there are tenants in a building, they work with them for uh, relocations and we have relocation plans that are developed for each of those properties. Yeah, I, I don't but doubt- But the resolution okay. did pass. Right, I, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't doubt that the process will be um, handled appropriately. I just was curious because that building has space, there's some space next to the building and I was just curious about the decision yeah, making we, about the about the location of the vent ventilation and whether it was necessary to utilize the building or not. And yeah, they did extensive analysis to look what could fit on each of those parcels, and there was just not a way. Because in addition, um, you know, to egress facilities, the ventilation facilities, there was above ground and basement level facilities, and they just could not fit it. And there were implications to impacts to the next property. So um, there was not a way to eliminate the use of that property. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion from somebody on the committee. Move to accept the report. Second. Second. All right, we'll move to a vote then. Foley? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes, thank Sorry. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to item D4, major local transportation planning status report. I think Wilson or is it Ramses? One of you is. Thank you again, okay. Chair John Risto, Director of Transportation. And this item will highlight some of the major transportation planning that we're doing. And with me is Ramses Madhu, Division Manager, and Wilson Tam, our Planning Manager for Planning. Thank you. And I think you guys are ready to go. Thanks, John. Um, Ramses Madhu, uh, Division Manager, Planning Policy and Sustainability. Um, this item is our semi annual update on uh, major transportation planning uh, efforts within the city. Um, we're going to keep it nice and short because we know we're hitting up on uh, time here. Um, this year has been a very big year, there we go, uh, for transportation planning uh, in San Jose. Um, we've brought to you the Downtown Transportation Plan, the Emerging Mobility Plan, the Move San Jose Plan, which is the Citywide Transportation Plan, um, and uh, we'll be bringing you West San Jose uh, tomorrow, um, as well as some big policy moves as well. Overall, um, we're working ourselves into this structure here, um, where uh, using the guiding policies of the city, uh, such as in uh, the general plan and climate smart, uh, we're then constructing the, 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 the big plan, Moose San Jose, which you already adopted, um, to kind of guide all of the other plans, uh, such as our modal plans, uh, like our better bike waste plan and the emerging mobility plan, uh, which then inform um, our uh, multimodal transportation improvement plans, um, which are our uh, transportation area plans. Um, it all kind of comes into one big um, system uh, that makes sure that everything is evaluated um, from a single perspective and projects are being uh, um, evaluated um, uh, equally um, and made sure we're bringing everything uh, forward uh, to the, uh, which, which ones move the needles the best. Um, all of this is under the roof, the, there we go, uh, the goals of Move San Jose, just kind of reminding the, uh, the committee um, about this. These are the overall goals that we as uh, DOT will be um, using or are using um, to evaluate um, and drive our work uh, when looking at new projects and which uh, efforts we should be um, prioritizing next. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Wilson, who's gonna talk a bit about our upcoming efforts. Um, thank you. Uh, Wilson Tam, uh, uh, Transportation Planning Manager at DOT. And um, as Ramses said, um, so all these hierarchy of planning processes were stemmed from uh, the idea that the city has a very ambitious climate goals and we really want to create a community-based planning process to identify um, strategies and associated projects and programs to be implemented in the city over the next 20 and 30 years. So um, what is presented to you in front of you right now is um, uh, you know, some of the existing uh, area-wide transportation plans that the city have um, either uh, adopted or about to be adopted. Um, and so uh, as, as you know, um, East San Jose 
um, the council has adopted the Amufumiendo plan uh, in 2021 and also adopted the downtown transportation plan uh, just last month. And we are about to present uh, to the council um, the West San Jose MTIP um, uh, next uh, tomorrow. Um, you know, I forgot to mention about uh, MTIP stands for uh, Multimodal Transportation Improvement Plans, which are actually the companion transportation plan for areas in the city where uh, the city envisions intensified growth. I mean, so these MTIPs are meant to identify a list of prioritized projects and programs to be implemented to accommodate future growth as well as addressing the existing community transportation needs. Um, so, uh, you know, as we know that like um, after the East San Jose downtown and West San Jose areas are, um, are, are, are about to have a uh, transportation plan, uh, that serves a very good east-west directional uh, uh, backbone for the city. And uh, what comes next um, is uh, to work towards the north-south direction. So, um, as you can see here, um, you know, uh, after uh, these three area plans are adopted, uh, DOT is ready to embark on uh, two additional MTIPs in the city, including uh, the Berryessa MTIP as well as the North San Jose MTIP. It's worth mentioning that Berryessa MTIP was actually uh, a project that have started a few years ago, um, and uh, due to staff shortage um, and other uh, issues, we would like to uh, prioritize the development of the uh, pre, uh, uh, aforementioned three plans first before uh, uh, reigniting the process for the Berryessa area. Um, so after the MTIPs are developed, um, the next step is for DOT to embark the design phase for some of the projects identified in the area plans. And um, most of the plans, most of the corridors can be designed internally by DOT, but there are also other major corridors that due to the uh, multi-jurisdictional nature and also uh, that uh, they, uh, there are many stakeholders along the corridor may require a multi-agency effort to really uh, uh, conduct a more detailed design phase uh, for these projects. So um, if I can direct our eyes onto just the blue lines on this map, you will see that uh, the city is about to uh, kickstart uh, on uh, you know, a few uh, corridors that have been identified by the MTIPs to have a big transportation projects coming forward. So including, um, you know, as you can see here, Stevens Creek Vision and Study, um, we have partnered with the uh, city of Cupertino, the county of Santa Clara, um, the city of Santa Clara, the VTA, and us uh, to, uh, to, to work on this transit priority projects on Stevens Creek. Um, uh, San, uh, Santa Clara Street uh, is a project uh, that is, uh, is identified as a big move in the downtown transportation plan. And so after uh, the council adoption of the plan just last month, we are ready to kickstart on um, you know, moving forward with one of the big moves, uh, Santa Clara Street, to work with um, the VTA, BART, and other stakeholders to really maximize the transportation potential uh, that these transit infrastructure have presented on Santa Clara Street. Um, King Road uh, is also worth mentioning here, um, uh, as uh, the M tips as you can see on the screen right here, uh, that only covers a segment of King Road. It's really important for us to acknowledge that there are also other parts of King Road that have not been uh, studied as an M tip, but with uh, that area have a lot of like disadvantaged communities, and we want to make sure that as we plan out the King Road corridor, that uh, it, it deserves. Um, a subsequent planning process, especially in the south uh, side of, of King Road. So we have secured uh, a grant to uh, conduct a corridor study on King Road, in particular focusing on the area of King Road south of 280. Monterey Road um, is also a transit, transit study uh, that we are going to kickstart next year um, uh, with the idea of uh, uh, you know, implementing quick build uh, transit priority features. Um, as well as along the southern side of Monterey Road, uh, we have partnered with um, Peninsula Open Space Trust, um, uh, uh, Santa Clara County uh, Open Space Authority, as well as the County of Santa Clara to, uh, to work on a wildlife crossing study along the southern side of Monterey Road between 
uh, Metcalf and Bailey Avenue to really figure out um, how to improve the streets and the existing wildlife crossing structures to improve uh, wildlife crossing. And that could uh, mean uh, some reconfiguration uh, uh, proposals uh, along the, uh, the street uh, infrastructure. And we want to say a, a huge thank you to the Monterey Working Group for uh, initiating the thought and, and work on um, that's motivating uh, the Monterey Road uh, Transit Study. And I think that concludes our report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move to comments from the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for wanting to be considering uh, the future of uh, transportation. Um, you know, uh, there's some real issues going on with San Francisco and with BART in terms of their transportation needs and cutbacks. Um, I don't think we're quite in that same space, thankfully. And I think we prepared kind of some interesting things based on actually, <laughs> you know, Muni and BART services that for years has been a, a real thing we can count on and uh, so a thank you to that I hope we can help Bart in this time and in, in Muni. Um, regional issues of transit I hope can be uh, hopeful in, in the coming years and that we this is a time to really start the focus that we can bring back the concepts of mass transit if we can in certain ways and not and it doesn't have to be totally fearful. Good luck how we can do that in such a sad time with this COVID. Uh, good luck how, how to really do that. Uh, we're trying to patch things together and I think we're doing some interesting work in San Jose. Thank you. Um, for uh, the, the, the VTA issues I mentioned earlier, oh, of course, to first mention, uh, good luck in, in, in offering uh, openness and accountability with the, all the tech that will be in the future, these transportation projects that really helps the, the concepts of community harmony a lot and open democratic practices, good sustainability, positive feeling. With all that in mind, uh, to quickly offer uh, the VTA ideas, uh, light rail to make that the center of our future. And, you know, uh, to have uh, buses travel in, in, in five mile concentric circles around the light rail transit stops is a way to refocus our feelings and, and, and attention towards a good light rail system in the future, I think. And it can save, uh, you know, uh, wear and tear on buses, gas, and uh, it's, it's overall good practices that uh, I hope can be considered. Uh, thank you for your time. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, where do I start? Uh, number one, it's disgusting that this city continues to neglect the historical injustices that we're experiencing in South Cipuedes, which is all the area in which you were talking about, South King Road. I know that because my father grew up, my mother, my abuelitas, my grandmothers all grew up in tents in that barrio. And the reason why they called it South Cipuedes was because there was no infrastructure, absolutely none, dirt roads. And these kids during the winter, this time of year, would have to walk in the mud. And then they went to school and were called dirty Mexicans, okay? And the Mexicans, that, that, that supposed Mexicans on this council that, that, that claim a raza, where's your raza advocacy now? I don't see it in these policy decisions, okay? Because you were, I want to know one thing. Let me give you a statistical fact. You like data points? I'm going to give you a data point. 37% of traffic fatalities happen on 3% of the landmass in San Jose. Let me repeat that. 30% of the fatalities happen on 3% of the land mass. I want to know the answer to one question. Did you use that statistical fact in order to get this grant money? That's what I want to know. And I want to know that from the DOT. I, you answer to me, homeboy. You don't answer to the council. You answer to me. Because that is my money and my people that are being exploited in order to service transportation issues for citizens that ain't even from Sonhole. All these people that you have planned to come to Sonhole, they're gonna be the beneficiaries of these infrastructure projects. So I wanna know the answer to that, Mr. DOT. Did you use these statistical facts in order to justify that grant money that you received to help ducks cross the- Back to the committee. 
All right, thank you. Any comments, questions, or a motion from my colleagues? Move approval. Second. Okay, then I guess we'll have a vote. Foley? Aye. Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. And Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess, John, you're going to stay in the box and introduce I'm the street here, sweeping yes. item. <laughs> D5, thank you. Um, and uh, we will continue with our street sweeping overview. And with me today is uh, Rick Scott, my deputy director, infrastructure management, infrastructure maintenance, along with Eric Hohn and Jennifer Sagan. So, Rick, anytime you're ready, I think we can start. All right. I will hand it over to Jennifer Sagan. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Jennifer Sagan, Division Manager, Department of Transportation um, for the Sanitary and Storm Sewer Operation and Maintenance Program. And our ESD colleagues did a great job of teeing us up today with their earlier discussion of the Municipal Regional Stormwater Permit, so thank you very much for that. So I'll skip down to the purpose of street sweeping is to prevent pollutants from entering the storm drains and waterways. Um, pollutants including uh, things in provision C10 through C13 uh, of the permit, including sediment, trash, nutrients, toxic metals such as copper from vehicle brake pads, and organic material. A lot of people think street sweeping is for beautification, but really the genesis of it is for pollutant removal off the streets. Next slide, please. So in San Jose, street sweeping is delivered by two teams. Uh, the Residential streets are swept once a month by the residential contractor Green Waste. They also deliver up to 20 enhanced sweeps per year where signs are posted in areas impacted by parking uh, to remove the cars to give the sweeper access to the curb. Uh, in the residential areas, approximately 20% of the routes or 367 miles have parking restrictions and they sweep approximately 36,000 curb miles per year, which is about 54% of all the street sweeping. The other side of the program is delivered by city in-house crews. They sweep at a higher frequency, so downtown is swept nightly, our business districts are swept twice per week, and arterial streets and bikeways are swept two times per month, although we overlay during the leaf drop season and um, try and remove leaves from bike lanes a lot more frequently. Um, parking restrictions in these areas are about 50% of the routes, um, or 179 miles. As a total of 31,000 curb miles swept per year, about 46% of the program. Next slide. The in-house city crews are employed by the Department of Transportation. We actually own the sweepers for the streets and the bike lanes. You can see uh, in the picture to the right, a narrow uh, bike lane that's being swept by the street super that we specifically purchased for narrow areas. Um, we routinely sweep and respond to calls when needed. Since the sweepers are in-house, if a call comes in, we're able to deploy somebody at any time uh, to pick up debris in the street. Um, we also respond frequently to police and fire emergency cleanups. And I'm gonna pass to Eric to talk about the residential street sweeping program. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Eric Hahn and I'm the Landscape and Traffic Maintenance Division Manager within DOT's Infrastructure Maintenance Division. As mentioned earlier, the residential street sweeping program provides monthly street sweeping in residential streets throughout the city using green waste. DOT inspection staff oversee the infield sweeping inspections while the Environmental Services Department, ESD, manages the actual green waste contract. DOT's inspection team ensures the neighborhood sweeping routes are getting swept, meaning every route is completed and sweepers are being effective getting up against the curb. Inspectors also identify obstructions such as parked cars, low hanging tree branches and items left in streets such as um, recycling bins, basketball hoops, cones for parking in some areas. Inspectors also assist property owners by providing information on sweeping frequencies and responding to questions or concerns. And we also work very closely with the parking compliance team to ensure uh, coordination is conducted prior to any enhanced sweeps and other special cleanup efforts. 
Lastly, the inspection team tracks the request for street sweeping signage and conduct parking impact studies to determine if the requested locations meet the street sweeping signage criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, the images in this slide show some of the most common issues that impact street sweeping. Large debris piles must be avoided by sweeper operators because there can be hidden items within the piles that can damage equipment or cause other problems. For example, on the picture to the left, um, you never know what's actually in there. If something is buried within there, the sweeper brooms, when they sweep, could actually send that you know undefined object out into um, the street and so forth. So we always avoid those and we use other measures. Um, sometimes it could be other programs to go clean up the debris so that the sweepers can continue resuming getting up against the curb. Uh, another common sweeping issue are the trees with branches that hang below 14 feet. And you can see that on the picture on the right. Um, the sweepers cannot get under the low hanging branches and risk damaging the sweepers. When there's low-hanging trees, the inspector will forward the location to the arborist staff within DOT who generate a notice to the property owner letting them know that tree pruning is needed. The middle picture shows the impacts of parked vehicles. Parked cars are probably the greatest impediment to street sweeping. One parked car results in nearly three car lengths of space that can't be swept because the sweepers are not maneuverable. Street sweeping signage is one way to address the issues with parked cars. However, signage can only be installed when funding is available. Enhanced sweeps are another option can, that can help remind and encourage residents to move their vehicles on sweep days. Next slide. The street sweeping program as a whole largely delivers what it is funded to do. The effectiveness of the sweeps is determined by using a five point scale. A score of five indicates an effective and complete sweep. If there are barriers that prevent sweepers from coming close to the curb, then this will result in a lower rating. Sweeping inspection staff actively inspect sweeping routes and are instrumental in working with property owners to eliminate sweeping barriers. Um, and that concludes my portion. Okay, thank you, Eric and Jennifer. Uh, my name is Rick Scott, Deputy Director, DOT Infrastructure Maintenance Division. In addition to the measures that uh, Eric just discussed, we track uh, the miles of, per miles completed by our sweepers. Uh, again, this is two separate uh, groups. We have the city crews and the contractor, uh, residential street sweeping. For the city crews, uh, route completion is tracked via uh, a system called telematics, so we're able to see where a sweeper is at all, time, at all times to ensure that the work is completed. And if there are missed areas, they are typically completed on Fridays, uh, not an extra shift. For RSS, we do have inspectors, as Eric mentioned, that uh, inspect every route on each day. They're not on every single, they don't follow the sweeper on the entire route, but they do spot check each route. And the, uh, the contractors are obligated to complete every route. So as you can see from our completion percentages, we have had some challenges, uh, particularly last year with staffing and equipment. Um, we were able to make some improvements in 21-22 and hope to continue that trend of completing all the miles that are assigned to our sweepers. Uh, there also was an audit back in uh, 2016. There were 14 recommendations and 13 of 14 of those have been implemented fully as of uh, today. <laughs> uh, we have one in progress that is largely dependent on the procurement of equipment and that this, uh, this recommendation in particular was there were street sweeping debris that was emptied onto the street um, as a staging area before it could be taken away uh, for its final resting place. Um, we are currently, again, in the process of procuring the hook lift truck and bins to be able to complete that recommendation, but we are close to having that uh, closed out. And uh, just as a reference for any residents uh, that might be curious, if you wanna look up when your sweep day is, here's the website. This is just an example of what you would see. It, it uh, provides many different service uh, cycles and, and days for you, but right there is street sweeping, so you can see when your day is. Uh, again, about 13% of our miles are signed, uh, so the rest of them you know, relies on residents being aware of when that sweep is occurring uh, for their neighborhood for the sweep to be effective. So that concludes our report. Um, we are all standing by for your questions. All right, thank you for the report. Let's go to comments from the public. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank yourselves for this item. In, in myself transitioning down to San Diego, 
Um, there is some beautiful old buildings and old architecture here that actually the same architect used to work in San Jose and there's similar buildings. So it's sad, I would hate to lose some buildings in San Jose and it's been a good experience for me in that. And, and from that, in San Diego, they're also working on the street sweeper issue. And um, they're dipping into their general fund to pay for, uh, you know, the program and for, uh, you know, and what pays for like uh, revenue in, in, in tickets and their, their new ticket prices, you know, the, the, the big issue was that, I mean, they're raising them by about 15, 20 bucks for a ticket uh, violation, in, you know, parking in, in sweet street sweeping areas. I, I, I hope that we're really trying to address the future of general fund issues for this kind of concern. Um, I, I just, I warn yourselves at this time as a way to hedge and work on those good practices. Uh, you know, it is part, I think, of the future of developing, uh, you know, future practices where people don't have to be uh, ticketed so much or, or, not, or, you know, fined so much steeply, uh, you know, for such violation. Um, so, and it's, 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 it's related to the general fund <laughs> and how, you know, things don't have to fully be relying on the general fund so much. And I think that's how it, the economics of the system works. So again, I just thought I'd mention it this time. I hope it can be of some help to you in, in, in this sort of item. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the two. You have data to provide to me as a, as a citizen. Your job is predicated on my tax dollars. And so when you come to these meetings, I want to know exactly my data points, my code, which ones are getting the most service, I, I, I don't want the work. That's what I pay you to do. I pay you to come to these meetings and give me data that I need because you have that in me. Okay, so what I want to know is by your code, who's getting the most service? Also, by neighborhood, down my neighborhood, getting ticketed the most for these street sweeping issues. Because these are an equity issue. And the way to put them up on the equity roads, Councilman Perales. Councilman Perales about three years ago, gave a presentation about streets and seeing how certain streets get serviced sooner than others and how the lack of service with respect to streets uh, accelerates the wear and tear on vehicles, on cars. And so that was just specifically towards the infrastructure in terms of the streets and the roads, but that's what this topic is. And so what that did is it taught me on the different applications of equity. Okay, and so the other question that I have for you is, do you think that equity is relevant to this topic issue? And if it is, why isn't it here, an equity analysis? And if it is not here, the answer to that question needs to be answered. Why? Why is it? Also, are you using any grant money that is predicated upon the death of the homeless? Is there any money that is being used grant monies that are being used that is predicated upon the deaths of homeless people in this city. These are relevant questions, and it's getting really sickening and, and tiresome of the dehumanization that you continue to perpetuate in these meetings by not thinking that you have to answer to me, because I represent the public and the Chicano community and the homeless community. Back to council to committee. Okay, well, thank you for the report. It rocked our world, obviously. Um, <laughs> We're going to go on to uh, comments from, from colleagues. We'll start with Councilmember Davis. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you for chairing today. I tested positive for COVID this morning and didn't want to uh, try to do this on Zoom, so I appreciate you doing that in person. Um, and I want to thank the uh, staff for the report. I really appreciate you putting this together. I have some questions about... Um, about the, the residential street sweeping in particular. You, I think, Rick, you said that the, the contractor is contractually obligated to complete street sweeping. What are the criteria? Is it just a pass fail? Either you go through the street or you don't because we've, I've personally seen, and I know uh, many other of my residents have personally seen them going very quickly um, and 
and sometimes it doesn't even seem like they're they're going to be able to pick anything up because of how fast they're going whether it's against the curve or not against the curb which is a separate issue and i know that there are reasons why they might not be against the curb. But can you answer the question about the criteria that they are contractually obligated to do, to fulfill? Yes, Councilmember, thank you for the question. Um, I am going to pass this one over to Eric Hahn to answer. Thank you, Rick, uh, and thank you, Councilmember Davis. Um, the contractor is required to sweep every um, curb and every uh, route. So when this happens, if this is happening, um, I would encourage residents and yourself and your team to call this into our residential street sweeping program phone number. Um, I can provide that for you later. Uh, it's 408 We do. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so what happens is we would need to do the assessment and kind of follow up. If there is a miss sweep, the contractor, if it's within before by about two o'clock in the day, they can actually go back out and sweep that same day. Typically, we will make it up within the same week. So um, it's really incumbent upon us to be made aware of the, the issues with the sweeping routes, mm -hmm. and then we can follow up uh, directly with the reporting party as well. Is there any um, plan to put the same tracking on the contractor's um, vehicles as we have on our there has, sure, there has been discussions on that, and of course that's subject to the appropriation of funding. So that would increase the contract costs uh, with the contractor. Okay, um, I, and I, I just like to, I guess we, we report whenever we can. I, I know there, the contractors sweep or are responsible for, I guess I should say, uh, over half of the streets and the fact that we're doing spot checking and relying on people to be home at the time of street sweeping means that there are probably more people in my district when where folks are able to work from home than there are in other districts where we know that folks, we just know from COVID um, that folks have to work outside the home. And, you know, we have differences. And so I think that's, um, I think that's an equity issue, honestly, that we need to address. Yes, Councilmember Davis, that, that's a that's a good point. Um, you know, in addition, I think we when we get a report, you know, sometimes of the of the sweeper going fast down the middle of the street, uh, we investigate each of those cases that come in. You know, and, and almost always it's a situation where they weren't able to access the curb. Um, but it is really a case by case basis as far as what's occurring, and we have a really good relationship with Green Waste, um, and we talk to them almost every day. So we're able to uh, call, like Eric said, call them back if it's within a certain time. Uh, and really, when it comes to uh, you know installing telematics on the sweepers, it is there is a provision for it in the contract. It is something we could potentially do. Uh, I think the question we always have to ask is what what is it telling us? You know, is it is it actionable information that can make the program more effective? Um, you know, and I think that's a policy question that we have to kind of debate and and decide upon. I hope that the next time you bring this street sweeping report to this committee that you bring us some options for that and some pros and cons and what the, what the available information will be um, on, the, on that telematics. I mean, clearly we think it's useful. We have it on our own city owned, on our own city owned vehicles. If we don't, I, I understand it's a cost benefit issue, but it is again, it's more, than 50% of the streets that need to be swept are being done by contractors. And I, I will say from every single one of my anecdotal uh, evidence points, I have not seen a great job being done. And I know it's, uh, it's part of a throwaway part of their contract because it's more about garbage than it is about street sweeping. Um, and I just wanna make sure that we have, we continue to have these discussions with them. Um, I'll move on, I have other questions. Enhanced sweeps, we do 20 a year. How, how are these streets chosen? And are they being evenly distributed across, across the districts or how, how do we get them? Um, 
usually this is actually the requests come from the community it can actually come from uh, the council offices from all over so uh, we don't have a set number of streets that we go out um, we do that based on our own observations and the reports that we get um, that sweeps are not happening that there's a large debris buildup. okay um, so the 20 per year is not they're obligated to do 20 enhanced sweeps per year it's just we do about 20 per year we have been, um, we are contracted up to 20, uh, but since the contract actually renewed in 2021, um, we were kind of in the middle of the pandemic. We actually did not do any enhanced sweeps in the previous fiscal year because parking compliance was not able to staff, um, provide the staffing support. Plus we also recognize that there were a lot of folks who did work from home. So we did not want to further kind of add to um, the chaos in the streets, but we are looking to, Sorry, um, we are looking to begin resuming the enhanced sweeps beginning January of 2023. So we still have not resumed those sweeps? Not in full force, no, we have not. Okay, again, I would like to, to request that the next time this report is brought to this committee that there is information about how many sweeps have been done in each of the past, say, five years with the most recent year, the streets being listed out. Um, and I'm making that part of my motion to accept this report with these, with these uh, requests. And then my third question is about signing more streets. So we have some areas of town where people move in and out quite a bit. There's, and, and they might live in multifamily units. So they have live in apartments where they may not know how to even find out what the street sweeping schedule is. Is there any plan for signing streets? Do we have anything um, about adding more signage to streets about what the street sweeping day is? I think we're always looking for opportunities to reach out to the community and that's kind of the lowest touch but most cost effective way for us to raise awareness. Um, you know, to add signage, physical signage, there's a significant cost. Uh, and again, it becomes a policy decision and a desire um, not only to allocate the funding, but within the community, it's often a very unpopular decision to add signed sweeping routes because it impacts parking in a severely impacted area. Um, so that's, again, we do have a queue. I don't know how many are in the queue right now. We do have a queue of several areas that we've done, received a request on a parking assessment, figured out the impact. Um, and then upon availability of funds, we're able to potentially add that both to the uh, sign inventory and then there's also the parking enforcement uh, uh, issue that's quite expensive uh, mm -hmm. but there is again without without specific direction or funding there's no way for us to expand that program and then there's also an element of renegotiating a piece of the contract with green waste um, when those areas are requested so there's uh, i think we, we mentioned the memo i don't have it offhand but there i think for every 100 miles it's what's that it's about eight eight hundred thousand miles eight hundred thousand dollars for every 100 miles signed that we would add are we 100 miles? Yes. Okay. And that's so. just the installation of the signs. It's yeah. an additional $36,000 to the contract for the sweeper because sign miles um, trigger a higher rate for the contractor because they have they to have be, to be there, there at a certain time. Yeah. yeah. So there's okay. elements, the elements are again, the, you know, that's the desire of the community, um, which is not always a sure thing, even if there's parking impact and then the availability of funds and the desire to, to fund that work. Okay. So for, I, I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the report with a request for the next report that comes to counts to this committee to include um, kind of a cost benefit analysis and discussion about telematics on um, the, the contractors vehicles for street sweeping with information about the last five years of the number of enhanced uh, sweeps that have happened with a list of the streets that have been enhanced got, gotten an enhanced sweeping for the previous year and then in addition i'm just going to add the in a, the queue please also publish in that report the queue of people that of places that have been requested for uh, street sweeping signage 
and what the estimated cost per street would be to add that. So that, that's do, my motion and direction for the, the next report. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, uh, Council Member Foley. Uh, good afternoon, thank you for the report. I appreciate it. I have a question about basic uh, street sweeping and how it's accomplished on our uh, major streets as it relates to the bike paths. We have bike paths that are protected bike lanes and it looks like it might be difficult for the street sweepers to get through there, but it's important that we clear the path so the bicyclists can get through. So what's our process for addressing debris in the bike paths in a protected bike lane? We have some downtown, we have them on Hillsdale, they're all over the place. And I noticed leaves are accumulating dramatically right now. Yes, thank you for the question. And it is quite difficult to keep them clear during the leaf drop season. Um, but in general, all bikeways are swept at least once a week. In the downtown area, they're swept twice a week. And um, we can respond to requests. So if people call in an obstruction, which we do get, um, we'll go and take care of it. Um, the, there have been circumstances where the sweeper went by in through the bike lane, cleared it off, and two hours later we went back and it was, looked like we hadn't been there. So leaf drop season is particularly challenging. Um, so we're trying to do the best we can with the resources we have. Um, but the, we have one sweeper that's narrow enough to get into uh, a bikeway with a clearance of at least seven feet. And we have a few in the city that are more narrow than that. And so we either go out with a blower and then have a uh, blow the debris out of the lane and then have a sweeper pass immediately to pick it up um, or do um, handwork with some of the crews. Oh, so, okay, so, so seven feet, you have a sweeper that can pass through a seven feet corridor, can you tell me, and maybe you don't have this information, you can get it to me later, is Hillsdale one of those? That it seems like those protected bike lanes, they're fairly new. They're, they, I feel they're probably not seven feet. I feel they're probably narrower than seven feet. But do you have that information or can you uh, maybe get back to me with that information? I think, I think the, the bikeways are wider, but the medians are not. Well, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. We'll get back to you on that, council member. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, that's all, the only question I had. Other than the street sweeper came by my house today and uh, to Councilman, Council Member Davis's point, they drove by very quickly. I observed them and they didn't do a very good job in my street. I mean, it's fine, It's there's leaves out there and it's rainy now, so you can't couldn't have tell, told anyway, but I was out there watching just because I was curious and I knew this was on our report for our council meeting, for our committee meeting for today. But that's it for me, thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you. Actually, based on that last comment there, um, do we uh, beef up services on street sweeping during the, the leaf fall season or right kind of you know, around this time frame where we know we have heavy leaf fall and we know that there may be rains? Is, is that something that we do regularly? Yes, we, especially in the downtown area, there's a focus on making sure the catch basins are clear of leaves and uh, potential localized flooding is mitigated, especially in the underpasses. Um, anything else you need to add? Okay. Okay, so that's something that we, we, we budget for and we do regularly then every year. That's good to hear. Um, actually, in regards to the, the bike lanes uh, that uh, Councilor Foley was talking about as well, um, have we done, done any not necessarily like an official audit with the auditor. Uh, I know we just did that on the whole program uh, recently, but have we done any internal auditing on the bike lanes um, specifically? Because I know once we've, or as we started to, to implement more of these protected bike lanes, I have heard from a lot of bicyclists that uh, not, not even just during the, the leaf fall season, but um, year round essentially that, that they have been pretty, uh, you know, full of trash. And so curious if we've done any internal auditing specific to just the sweeping of the bike lanes. 
you know, I wouldn't use the word auditing, but we've certainly produced analysis and kind of tried to figure out how to meet those needs. And as a result, we procured that uh, smaller sweeper to kind of do that focused work. And I think we've got another one in the pipeline right now um, to try to meet those de demands. So it is a, a, a type of infrastructure that was not originally scoped out, you know, when the contract was produced and kind of when this program was built. Um, and that's one of the areas that we're growing, you know, as time goes on and as the infrastructure expands, we are using the budget process and we are using kind of our own operations to inform ways to make sure that that service is provided in the future. Yeah, thank you. I saw that in the report made it sound like um, we were acquiring a, a new um, sweeper for specific for the bike lane. It, it wasn't clear that we already had one. I was personally aware that we had one. So, but I, I guess um, we're adding to that, which is yeah, good. Our goals have to. That's good. I, I would say likely we were, we need to beef that up as we continue to add to our bike infrastructure network, um, right? Our ability to keep those bikeways clean is going to be the next um, you know, unusable rise can be the next important step um, to our community. And so I think this absolutely has to be a, a major component there. Um, uh, we just did the contract renewal. Uh, remind me, I'm not looking at the report at the moment. When, when, when is it coming back up again? 35, 2035 or something? 2030, 2036. 2036. Yeah, it's 15-year okay. contract. I remembered it correctly. Um, it, that would likely be the best opportunity to try and, and make some enhancements, like maybe what our chair was saying on, you know, uh, do we want to have some tracking devices on, on these vehicles where we wouldn't have to pay for it? Is there any other opportunity like that kind of midway through contract or to open it to say, hey, if, you know, we didn't want to pay for that type of infrastructure, um, is there an opportunity for that? Or are we just on the hook if we want to, we want to add these to it, we're just going to have to pay for it? It's quite a long contract. Um you know, like lengthwise, um, but I, you know, I'm, there are some ways, you know, in particular telematics is one of the items that we can kind of reopen. So we'll work with our colleagues uh, who manage the contract and kind of see what the options are. But, um, you know, in, in particular, most of the bike lanes are on streets that the city maintains. So like the in-house crews uh, provide the sweeping for, so that that's why we're adding in-house um, capacity to our fleet, you know, that would be the focus. But, you know, like things like telematics, the council member David or Chair Davis brought up, uh, those are things that we can kind of re-engage with the contractor on, I think, uh, pending the availability of funds. Yeah, that, yeah, and I'm sorry, I switched topics a little bit on the bike lanes, but, but in general, my interest was similar to uh, Chair Davis on the telematics, and rather than maybe have a discussion next year on how can the council, uh, you know, maybe fund something like that, I, I would like to see, could we reconsider opening the contract and you know is that something that we would like them to to implement um, on their vehicles or see how quickly right that they could because i would have to echo my colleagues um that i, I don't i don't see the, the residential street sweeping is very effective and in fact i, I have a, a suggestion that i think you know maybe we want to explore but for instance uh, i i have um been in my current home for for two years and the prior uh residences that i had been in um, sort of saw the, the same thing. So over the last eight years as, that I've been on council, I've been in three different um, neighborhoods and blocks. Each one of them has been more or less the same. Th this, this one that I'm in now is the most impacted with vehicles on the street. Uh, but even the ones that, that were not as impacted still had several vehicles on the street during the street, street, street sweeping day. Uh, and, and the main reason, and I know DOT staff, we've, we've gone back and forth on this over the years is, is, you know, obviously residents aren't really aware, right? We don't have signage. There's no requirement to move the vehicle. It's sort of just, if you know, you know. Um, and as we've heard, right, the neighborhood, different reasons people are moving in and out, or quite frankly, even if you've been in a neighborhood for a long time, a lot of people don't know when their street sweeping day is. Uh, and that's just, that's, that's, you know, I think more standard than not. And so what you get is you get a lot of these vehicles, as, as the report has noted and the audit did, that's the biggest impediment to the street sweepers. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think we may have some uh, drivers that, you know, they drive down a block and they see there's a ton of cars and they may, you know, if they were to go slower, I think maybe they'd hit an extra space or two, but I, I would agree that, that for the most part, the reason that they don't is because they're, you know, they're zooming down a block because, you know, 70% of it or so, 60% of it or so is, is, is full of, um, you know, of cars. And, and I know that for certain, again, in the neighborhood I'm in now, is extremely impactful to vehicles. And I, the suggestion that I have is that I would almost say 
we're wasting our time and we're wasting our money uh, with these with the contractors with green waste that they were saying hey can you just zoom down you know however many blocks every, once a month um, and and really not clean this you know the, the gutters um, I would suggest that if if we're going to continue this same process we might as well stop doing that kind of wasting our time sending these these street sweepers down a block where they're not cleaning anything and rather say how, how are we going to actually get out to a street and, and, and get a street sweeper out and where they can clean it? Is it redirecting some of those funds that we may save um, on these regular street sweeping to, to the enhanced street sweeping? As you pointed out, maybe it's only on average 20 a year. I know my office has taken advantage of that over the year, trying to request you know a couple at least um, every year within the district, at least before COVID. Um, is it more of those, right? Is it as council member uh, uh, or our chair, chair Davis was saying, is it looking at that list of streets that have requested signage? And, and I know I've, I've helped a couple of streets in D3 do that over the years. Is it getting more of them on the list and getting them signed, you know, and, and, and are you exchanging that? I think that's a conversation worthy of the council to say, hey, do we want to talk about that trade-off? Um, and, and again, I think the reason being is that I, I honestly feel we're wasting, we're wasting some money and we're wasting resources right now by simply having these, these street sweepers zooming down blocks. I can tell you again, the two years I've been in my current residence, not once has it cleaned uh, my street. <laughs> just because it just, it's a shorter block, right? On 14th street and it just kind of drives right by because um, there's so many cars. And so, you know, two years worth of wasting time and that's all I've seen. I'm imagining it's been going on a lot longer in neighborhoods like mine that are impacted with a lot of cars. So I think that's a, a worthy conversation as well. Maybe that, that the council can explore next year as, as they look at this program. Uh, that we have a street sweeping sounds like my colleagues are, are interested too in you know sort of for, furthering that dialogue um, so I am excited to see where it goes uh, next year as this comes back thanks okay well we have a motion that includes uh, some additional um, information to report in the next week time to come back so let's take a vote Holy. I had raised my hand oh sorry I didn't see it it came up late yeah, yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Councilmember Esparza yeah, I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I, I'm going to, you know, obviously support the motion. I just had a couple of comments. Um, one, I agree. I think most folks don't know when street street sweeping day is. Um, and I think we all deal with a lot of uh, constituent calls about that. I, uh, I wanted to also uh, just bring up the issue of outreach um, and recognize that uh, a lot um, uh, a part of the part of her motion of looking at signage and but more than that, we also really need to communicate with folks because uh, particularly in overcrowded areas um, and areas where there are a lot of shift workers, um, you know, there are parking is in demand as we all know and so really how we communicate with residents um, is just as important as what we communicate so i just wanted to bring that up that's it for me thank you thank you and now let's vote foley aye perales yes esparza yes cohen aye and davis yes thank you all right, that brings us to the final item on the agenda, D6, uh, reach code update with, um, to increase multi-vehicle EV charging stations. Carrie and your team, thanks for the, your patience and sticking around. Good afternoon, Carrie Romanel, Environmental Services. Um, we're gonna try and move through some of the material pretty quickly so we don't lose you all and we have time for um, for your questions, et cetera. So with that, I'm gonna skip my intro and hand it off to uh, Julie Benevente to walk us through the materials. So just quick background um, on this topic, uh, Climate Smart and the Pathway to Carbon Neutrality both set accelerated um, electric vehicle and local renewable goals. Um, California also adopted some rules around 100% zero emissions car sales by 2035. And we have an existing building reach code that does require extra EV charging equipment and infrastructure. Okay. 
Um, so council provided us with, with direction to return um, before the end of 2022 with an estimated marginal per unit cost of expanding multifamily EV charging infrastructure. They also asked us to look at um, updating roof space design standards and, to, and ways to mitigate embodied carbon from building materials. <clears throat> we did return in June 2022 with an update on the carbon mitigation strategies and some roof um, top design. So this is returning with some more information. Um, so just to set a little bit of um, the structure here before we jump into the cost analysis, I wanted to provide a, a basic understanding on some of the terms. EV capable uh, means that there's an electrical panel capacity that allows for future installation of EV charging equipment, whereas EV ready goes a step further and requires installation of a charging outlet. The term EVSE or electric vehicle service equipment is the actual installation of a charging station. Um, and those EVSE can be level one, level two, or fast chargers, um, depending on what's installed. There's also an automated load management system that can allow for power sharing across multiple stations. And there's uh, low power level two charging options, which charge at a slower rate than the standard L2 um, level two chargers, but provide cost savings in terms of electrical infrastructure needs. And there's also a term called networking or networked um, chargers. So that just means that it's um, linked to Wi-Fi. So in the city's cost analysis, we looked at four scenarios. The first is just a comparison of our current reach code. The option 1A is council direction, looking at 5% EVSE, um, the rest EV ready. The 1B option is an actual regional model reach code that came out um, where Santa, San Mateo, um, the rest of Santa Clara County and the Alameda County um, both worked together, or all three worked together to create that. And option 1C is a networked option of that model reach code. So option 1A, which was the council direction, um, and the 1B are both cost comparable um, in terms of the total percentage of total construction cost to the city's current reach code, as you can see in the table. Uh, while option 1C is slightly higher, but still um, cl close to cost. Um, option 1B and 1C include both EVSC at 15%. Um, they're just a difference between whether they're uh, called dumb, which is non-networked, or whether they are actually networked um, in the system. Next. So just some key takeaways from the analysis we had. Um, up, updating the minimum to the minimum of the 5% EVSC, which was the council direction, um, is again cost comparable um, to the city's current reach code standards, the, the cost for that, and does provide significantly more EV charging spaces because as you um, heard earlier, EV Ready allows for actual charging at the site. Um, and of course, implementing at the time of construction will be significantly less costly than implementing as a retrofit. Um, so these are for, since this is gonna apply to new developments. Uh, for the embodied carbon um, item, that is, the embodied carbon is estimated to be about 2.7% of a consumption of San Jose's consumption based emissions. However, embodied carbon is not included currently in the city's um, greenhouse gas inventory since it is consumption based, so we don't use that model uh, for doing inventories. Um, existing statewide legislation and local policies require or encourage the use of more environmentally friendly materials. So this issue is becoming part of some of the codes that are coming out, some of the direction. Um, such as both timber and low carbon um, concrete. And also Cal Green, which is uh, part of the city, uh, part of the building code does have voluntary measures for low carbon concrete mixes. There's also a, a regional working group that San Jose is a part of, and we're continuing to look at developing a regional policy guide um, around embodied carbon. On the solar side, um, as you know, we have quite a bit of solar installed in San Jose, but we still have a lot of opportunity here. And we do have a goal of one gigawatt by 2040 set through the Climate Smart Plan. Um, we do have a reach code which does require electric, uh, I'm sorry, solar ready um, infrastructure and also have um, a, pr a pretty model online city permitting for solar as well as a lot of uh, the federal tax credits were extended to incentivize solar installations. So we are um, still watching and analyzing the CPU's uh, final um, net energy metering rule, which did just recently come out and just seeing how that's gonna influence some of the solar installations. 
so city staff hosted five public webinars where we talked with contractors, developers, uh, we invited labor organizations, affordable housing developers, landlords, HOAs, property managers, and, and community-based organizations. Generally, there was support for expanded EV infrastructure, um, particularly if the cost remains similar to the city's current REACH code. Um, we did have some feedback around three theme themes, um, again, talking about managing the cost, um, so there's ways to do that either through considering the lower power or the L1 charging requirements. Um, also, there was a suggestion to reframe the EV charging around equity concerns and just looking at connecting directly to the electrical service panel so that individuals could monitor and manage their own charging directly rather than having a, a management company charging back pricing to them. Um, there was also a suggestion for the city to assess EV ownership data in multifamily housing to support the need for additional infrastructure. So our recommendation is to, to accept this update and we will open for questions. All right, thank you. Let's uh, go to the public. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, you just knocked off 15 minutes of my time, but I mean 15 seconds, but that's cool. Go ahead, keep it. Um, the analysis that is being done with respect to EVs is going to be completely inaccurate, and here's why. Mexicans aren't going to aren't going to participate in these numbers. Okay, so deferring this to your CBO language and deferring to Somos Mayfair and SB Rising and CC Puedes Collective and all these other organizations that are already corrupted, okay, and you're in the city's yes people, okay, the numbers are going to be inaccurate. That's number one. Number two is that this is an absolute equity issue because the major consumers of this infrastructure that you're building and you're using monies from not only the general fund, but you're also using transportation dollars and transportation grants to do this. Those transportation grants are predicated upon the deaths of people that are experiencing poverty in this city. So when you connect all these dots together and see it from my perspective instead of the CBO's myopic view, then you see a more comprehensive view of what I'm talking about whenever I talk about equity within the context of EV uh, placements. You are not going to have Mexicans that are going to transition to EV vehicles because that those this infrastructure is being created in order to service people that aren't even citizens of this city yet. And that's a fact. It's going to be most of the populations that are inside the market rate housing developments. It's not going to be the homeboy over there on Orlando or, or, or over there by uh, Pensacola Apartments. They're not going to be the ones that are the major consumers. It's going to be people of a certain economic status. Those don't include Mexicans. So if there ever was an equity analysis that is absolutely necessary, it's when the context of EV. Blair Beekman. All right, thank you. As I have been offering, uh, Blair Beekman here, as I have been offering a public meeting this week, there seems a newfound maturity in humanity, or last week I was offering, there seems a newfound maturity in humanity and depth that may be taking place throughout San Jose City Government Departments at this time. And what seems a current better study of the past several years in the continual ongoing issues of San Jose. These are practices of government that simply include better listening and dialogue with everyday community. In the transitional year of 2023, good ideals, better listening and cooperation from all sides can be important steps to the more progressive good future many are planning and hoping for in 2024 and 25. These can also be the good ways, adjustments, and adjustments towards our better human ideals and practices for all sides uh, that can be easier for us in 2024 and 25 as well. From this, I hope Mayor Licardo can learn, can take to heart in his future endeavors what may be his more lasting legacy of helping to build a civic innovation staff that is currently dedicated to learning how to work more openly with everyday community and with tech ideas. I hope Mayor-elect Mahan will want to respect these concepts of legacy and to simply allow city government staff to continue to work 
and a lot that can be possible at this time in their current interesting good direction. And to quickly speak to the mayor's questions from last Thursday's Smart City Committee, as law enforcement technology usually can take first priority in our current local communities, it is from this that the future of tech open public policies and accountability questions can then begin to better ask exactly and realistically to ask how important is the need? And questions like, uh, if there is already ample surveillance tech and, tech and data collection in a neighborhood or area, the responsible questions of how much is enough and minimum use and deployment ideals should be, start to become more clear as a shared holistic community vision. Thank you. Back to the committee. I do see one more hand up now. Caller ending 1367. Yes, this is Lillian. You talked about um, carbon reserves, and I was a little bit stuck on that because when you uproot trees, especially trees that have been um, here for hundreds of years, if not longer, you actually uproot the carbon reserves. So I'm wondering how that will interact with your report. Thank you. Caller ID 1367. I think it's 1275 now, right? Oh, sorry. 1275. Yeah. Hi. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, hi. This is Linda Hutchins Knowles. I'm a San Jose resident, and I'm calling in with my Actera hat on, where I'm the e mobility and advocacy senior manager. I also am speaking on behalf of the EV Charging for All Coalition. I'm one of the co-leaders. This is a broad and diverse coalition of many organizations and elected officials and individuals who are united in our mission of ensuring equitable access to EV charging for all residents, whether they live in single family homes or multifamily housing. So um, I'd like to first thank so much the mayor and the city council members and the staff for doing this marginal cost analysis to understand what extra costs there might be to make San Jose's code more comprehensive and equitable. And we are delighted to see that the results are that for approximately the same cost, and in some cases even a little less than San Jose's current reach code, San Jose could replace the 70% of, quote, EV-capable parking with actual EV-ready charging. I want to emphasize that EV-capable is actually incapable of charging. It just means capable of updated labor, but at great expense and great hassle for the residents, such that it very rarely happens. So if you want residents to actually be able to charge in these communities, they need to have EV-ready charging. I also want to comment that Green Latinos and other groups did a study and found that communities of color and low-income communities are highly interested in obtaining electric vehicles, and that the biggest barrier to charging is not just the cost of EVs, but it's actually the lack of access to affordable charging. And why is it not affordable? Because it's not at home. If you don't have access at home, if you live in an apartment or condo and have to use public charging, the rates are much higher. And so we urge you to please update San Jose's reach code. This is going to be good for every resident, and transportation security is part of equity. Since beginning in 2035, you won't be able to purchase a new gas car in the state of California. It's essential to begin. Back to the committee. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions, um, as you probably knew I would. <laughs> um, so I've always been concerned with the idea of the EV capable, because just like with the solar ready, which also bothers me, because I don't think anyone ever then goes back and puts solar on the roof of a building after it's been built, maybe very rarely. Um, EV capable, you're spending all that money and then you have to spend more later to do extra work and I'm not sure anyone will ever get the charging station. So um, this looks like a no-brainer to me, right? The cost is the same to go EV ready for all the spaces and, or for all the units. Um, so are, are, we come, are, we, are you going to come back to the council with a recommendation to update the REACH code at some point? What's the plan for how we adopt one of those other options? Thank you, and um, and thank you for your comments and interest. Frankly, um, you know, we uh, we're looking for some feedback, and then um, 
certainly will come back with recommendations and we haven't established a, a clear timeline. We do uh, intend to have a study session on Climate Smart uh, in the uh, start of 2023-ish, but, uh, but looking for some feedback and um, kind of what, what interests the, uh, the committee. Certainly we've learned a lot from talking with our community as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> in my mind, it would almost be malpractice to keep the current reach code requirement there that costs just as much as getting everything to EV ready and not to immediate, and allow buildings that are going in now not to actually provide the EV ready sites. Um, so I hope we, we come back sooner rather than later to, uh, to at least get direction on this item if, it ne if it's needed. Um, because I wouldn't want buildings to go in and then not end up with the capability to do EV, EV charging. Yeah, we, we agree with that. And you know, with, uh, with some of the callers that talk about, particularly in, um, in certain parts of town where there's not a lot of uh, commercially available charging, really, if you don't have the charging at home, you're not gonna be able to get an EV. Right. And, um, and it, is, it is more affordable. And so, uh, yeah, we have a, a keen interest in having uh, EV charging uh, ready, uh, fully functional EV charging for every uh, resident that's interested in the city. So my other question then is, when I look at the differences between the, the various options, 1A, 1B, um, the difference is in, the diff in, in using EV ready versus um, actual charging stations. EV ready to me is, I mean, is adequate as far as charging vehicles. You don't need to have a charging station to charge a vehicle. I know that the state requirement still has some percentage that need to be actual charging stations as opposed to um, receptacles. Yeah, correct. So um, that's why we don't have options that go with zero EVSC. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's why. I was asking. Yeah, and and you can still charge with the EV ready option. It's an outlet, an actual outlet. Yeah, I mean you can charge with it for sure. That and that, I mean that's what is very straightforward. Um, so we have to go with EVSE. Why would we go with um, anything other than? Well, I guess on option one A, why would we go with ten percent of the 40 amp chargers versus and 85 percent 20 amp rather than all 20 amp or i mean how do, how how would you get around the differences and the equity issues with some some having faster charging than others why would we not just go with all one kind of charging station so you're talking about the difference between the ev ready the low power and the, there's just a cost yeah the low difference. power yeah the, i mean i understand there's a cost difference so i'm yeah. asking why why would we not just go 100 or what, 95% of low power, is there, a re, is there a regulatory requirement to be at the high power for a certain percentage? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I'm assuming that the reason why we had this is mainly because of the cost issue and just trying to keep it similar to the reach code to show that there's an option that... Uh, no, I get it. I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm, so I'm even almost asking if... Because otherwise, some units would only get assigned a low power charger and some would get a high power charger. That doesn't seem necessarily right. If, you ha if, if the low power is adequate, would we not want to just go with low power for all? Well, and I think that's why we went through the analysis to really show a broad picture of all the options so that we get to sort of the, the right fit for our city and where, you know, is it worth a couple more dollars to kind of be fully ready um, or, or not? And it's not even a couple more dollars. It's yeah. even better. If this analysis is correct, it's not even more expensive. Um, so, I mean, I, I know if you're asking for sort of direction, my own personal interest, and I don't know what the rest of the committee He's going to say, but my own interest is certainly one one A or one B. One B is a little cheaper, but probably that's it, it, that's within the noise of the cost at that point. But um, we we should, we should be pushing quickly to get there, and I hope he comes back soon with a recommendation that the council can discuss so that we can move in that direction. Thank you. Um, one other, just one other question. Uh, um, oh, back on the equity question. So so. I know that when you, you know, charge without smart, when you charge, when you, when you have it all running in through one breaker, one breaker system, you, you can't necessarily tell who's using the electricity and you have to have a, a third party doing that analysis for you. And we'd have, it, would have, it would be a more costly installation in order to have it go into the individual unit, have the space tied to the unit. Well, I think anything where you're separating out billing has an administrative cost component to it. Um, and so that would change the pricing. But Julie, what would you add? 
Yeah, so um, in terms of an additional cost going directly to the panel, yeah, we we actually are looking at an analysis on that as well, since that was kind of an issue that was brought up, and so we're running that analysis right now, but it looks like it could be around $1,000 per dwelling um, to do that, which is, it's not, that's not, you know, super substantial in terms of the, the big picture of cost, but it still is an additional cost to do that. Right, okay. So I guess we'll hear all of those options when it comes back to council in the future, right? Is that correct? Um, and then this, this uh, reach code, this installation applies to affordable developments just like it does to the others, right? So there's not, there's no difference in terms of market rate versus others having this, every unit would have EV ready charging. Um, and then what, how does this apply to commercial buildings in parking? Is, does it apply there? So the city already has a, a reach code that applies for EV charging that applies to commercial. So this was just looking at multifamily right, okay. only. Okay, thank you so much. Um, do we need to add something in motion about uh, bringing back this item at a certain date or do we just, we'll just wait until January and see when you wanna? Uh, it's certainly up to you. Okay. Um, maybe a suggestion I mean, I is no later than. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion or make a motion myself, I guess, to make it easier <laughs> um, to accept the report and, and bring this back to council um, by, I would, I would hope probably end of January if possible. It might Second. be a little bit. Or end of February. I don't what's think a, what's we a reasonable date? That's what I guess that what I'm fast. Yeah, okay. the end, end of February? <laughs> end of February? M March. March. End of, okay. End First of March. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was asking for. With <laughs> Sorry, thanks. <laughs> okay, I'll say end of March. Bring it back in the first quarter of 2023. I had heard a second, so we'll move one, on. One to clarifier, it. Chair. Uh, did you want it to back to the committee, or did you want something to go? No, I, I think we should. If we're going to need a council direction, we should bring it to council before, in the first quarter. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. So I think we're ready to vote. Foley. Aye. Perales. Yes. Esparza. Yes. Cohen. Aye. And Davis. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So that brings us to open forum. Caller 1275. Yes, hi, again, it's Linda Hutchins-Knowles. Um, I wanted to uh, just thank you for supporting that motion. And uh, I know this is not on the agenda today and it's not gonna be possible to be agendized um, today, but I do wanna remind you with my mother's out front hat on that we really are hoping that Council will move swiftly to consider sunsetting the exemption for distributed energy resources that currently allows any facility that wishes to use gas power DER to install that in our city without the ability to say no. And we just want to remind the council members that this remains a very big and dangerous loophole and it's not necessary because there is a, a hardship exemption. And so we understand that the schedule was too full to fit that in this year, and we do hope that um, you all will be champions of our climate neutrality commitment and actually help us live up to it by bringing us back at the earliest possible time. Thank you very much. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, thank you for your patience, as I may lack a certain depth on, the, on this issue. Around December 15th, uh, the CPUC will be uh, voting uh, to possibly uh, uh, end the future of solar power uh, subscribe, uh, subsidies for everyday persons at the residential level uh, to save money on, on, on solar use. It is a program, uh, I, I, I spoke, I spoke uh, previously uh, on the previous item, I gave a very long speech that was actually meant for public comment time. And I wanted to speak on this one on, on, on previous item, but that's okay. I will just simply say, uh, thank you for the meeting today. And uh, uh, let's have hope that uh, Governor Newsom is working on fossil fuel issues, solar power issues that by the CPUC vote in mid December, we can have some uh, compromise in the solar subsidy future uh, that works positively for local our low income communities in the future. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. 
I could probably count on one hand how many times I've agreed with Councilwoman Davis. And this is one of those times. I want to thank you for seeing the, the wisdom in providing that particular piece of analysis. I think with respect to speaking about data in general is that the ability for us to move forward as a city and predicating those decisions on data, those decisions are going to be insufficient and inadequate if the proper data is not presented at these meetings. That is, that is very simple, it's very basic. And sometimes the truth is, is just that simple. It's not complex. You know, the greatest scientists in the world have told us time and time again that the most adequate answer and the most truest answer and sufficient answer is the most simplest. And that is just bring the data, man, so that we can make informed decisions about what we as a city are, are, are building our policies on. It's, this is very basic. You know, I don't, it's a waste of my time as a citizen to come to these meetings and have inadequate data points given. And then, oh, okay, well, well, we'll take care of that later. We'll take care of that later. We'll take care of that later. Not Charlie, we take care of that now. We take care of that right here, right now. That's why you need to come prepared to these meetings so that those decisions can be made because these are money. These are, these are millions and millions of dollars, okay, that are being, uh, being spent out of general fund or the, 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 the money the grant money that is being used from the deaths of, of people that are experiencing poverty. Those transportation dollars, it's, it, it is sickening the way that the city exploits the poverty by monitoring. Caller 1367. Yes, this is Lillian from District 3. Um, I used to live in District 6. I'm making a comment uh, earlier on the street sweeping because I was not able to comment earlier, um, but the $800,000, was it $800,000 that I heard correctly that would be used for signage so people would know when the street sweeper was coming or was it 80,000? Because if it was near a million, I would find that very um, uh, disliking personally. I don't think that's a necessity. And the other comment I had was when the gentleman mentioned 20, a year did he mean 20 streets swept a year 20 areas 20 i i couldn't understand where the 20 came from so if you could clarify that but um deb davis does want uh, to put that into the next um uh, meeting with the uh, street sweeping signage and i believe mr Perel has also agreed to that my 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 open forum question really is and my comment really is if you can give eight hundred thousand dollars for signage for people to move their cars to have street sweepers come in, why can't you use that money for an open election such as in District 10 and 8? Thank you. Back to the committee. All right, we're adjourned at 4.10 p.m. Thank you.